Hey everybody, welcome to the 10% True Podcast. Quick message from me before you get stuck in. This podcast is free, so there's no advertising. I don't monetize it on YouTube. You don't have to sit through any annoying adverts, and I don't even ask for any money through Patreon. But if you could, in exchange for that, drop me a like, leave a comment, share my content, and if you're listening to the podcast version, maybe leave a review of the channel, that would be hugely appreciated. It will help me to grow my audience, which is really what I'm trying to achieve. Anyway, with that, I'll let you get back to listening. Enjoy. Junior, welcome to 10% True. Thanks for coming on the channel. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. The, the subject of our conversation today is very close to my heart. As, as a former journalist, the first book, first serious book I ever wrote was about the Strike Eagle. And I had the, uh, the pleasure and the privilege of going to St. Louis and visiting Boeing and visiting with uh, a number of the individuals who were responsible for making the Strike Eagle, the 15E, a reality. Uh, but I never really had much of a chance to speak to people who were on the other side of the equation, so the Air Force side of the equation, about bringing the aircraft into service. And that is, of course, Junior, where you come into the conversation because you were initial cadre for the F-15E Strike Eagle. So that is what we're going to talk about today, the introduction of that airplane to service, where it came from, the trials and tribulations of, of bringing it into Air Force service and, and the uh, what it looked like from your point of view as, as a, a, an air crew member in, in that community. But before we do that, let's find out a little bit about you. Who, who are you? How did you get into the Air Force? Why did you join the Air Force? Uh, and what was your career up until that point in time? Uh, I uh, uh, went through ROTC at uh, Rensselaer Polytech, uh, came into uh, uh, came into the Air Force in the in the early '80s. Uh, got my uh, got my nav wings in um, uh, you see December of '82. And went to electronic warfare school for about six months, uh, and then went to the F-111 at Cannon. Uh, and I was uh, early on in my career. I thought going to test pilot school was really where it's at, and uh, and I changed my mind <laughs> for a few years in the operational world, uh, and was was very motivated uh, to go to fighter weapons school. And uh, in, in fact, I had a package submitted for F one eleven fighter weapons school uh, at the same time that I was selected for the initial cadre of the Strike Eagle. Uh, so I, I kind of I eventually went to weapons school, deferred it for a few years, had to wait until after Desert Storm. Uh, before the the uh, F-15E weapon school was stood up at Nellis, but I, I did eventually go and in, in uh, graduated in 1992 uh, in the the first full size class of the of the Strike Eagle weapon school. So that's kind of how how I got into the airplane. In it, when they selected the initial cadre, um, uh, just you know, every, every one of us will tell you. I was just lucky to get into that. Uh, and there, there's, you know, perhaps a little bit of false modesty. I mean, there were some incredibly talented people uh, in that squadron. Uh, but uh, but everybody, everybody, you know, there were, I, I'm sure you would easily find 32 equally talented people that didn't get to, didn't get to, to fly the airplane early on like we did. A lot of people converted later on. But the, uh, uh, at that time, the Air Force was really short of, PCS funds, permanent change of station funds. So it was very, very hard to move anywhere unless you had at least three years time on station. Uh, and I had PCS to Canon and my wife didn't get there until almost two years after I did. Uh, you would think a nurse in the Air Force volunteering to leave Sacramento, uh, California and come to Clovis, New Mexico, you'd think that would be a pretty easy request to grant. But it turns out no. So they didn't they didn't release her a day early. So I was kind of, you know, throwing out the boat anchor, trying to stay at Canon as long as I could just to align PCS cycles with my wife. And then we figured we'd wind up at Hayford or Lake and Heath on, on our next assignment. Uh, so I was just lucky. I, I had a lot of time on station. So when they when they started selecting for the initial cadre, I had enough time on station to move. And there were, you know, you know, a lot of guys in the squadron and other squadrons that were, you know, better than me, but they'd only been on station a year and they, you know, they weren't going to get the opportunity to move. So that was, you know, that that played a lot into who got selected. Um, the uh, uh, there were 32 people in the uh, in the initial cadre, uh, 20 pilots and, and 12 WIZOs. Um, 
And of that initial group, uh, as, as you know, many, many people will tell you, 27 out of 32 people on that list were fighter weapons school graduates. So, you know, for, for anybody who has ever dealt with the, you know, the clash of egos when you get two patchworks and a debrief, imagine what it's like when 27 out of 32 people in the squadron are all patchworks. Uh, and I was one of the few that was not uh, early on there. Um, and uh, it was, you know, some of the, some of the other guys who were not patchworks would will, will just tell you the the entertainment value of sort of sitting back. And in fact, some of the early students would say that, you know, the great thing was, you know, the, the, the way to survive a debrief in the early FDU days was to get the two patchwork instructors arguing with each other. And then they'd eventually kick the students out of the out of the debrief so they could continue to argue with one another. <laughs> But but having said that, a, a great and talented uh, group of people. But to, to back up a little bit on the, on the evolution of the aircraft, as you said, the, the aircraft, um, uh, the, the initial dual role fighter was tail number 291, which anybody who's an F-15 aficionado has probably heard of that jet. It was, it was a, actually an F-15B model, and it was one that, that uh, McDonnell Douglas used for various testing and whatever. It was a, it was a company, company-owned aircraft, not an Air Force-owned aircraft. Uh, and they eventually, in the, in the 1980s, uh, converted that into the dual role fighter demonstrator, you know, put the, the rudimentary glass cockpit in the back seat uh, and implemented a lot of the air and ground stuff. Now, despite the fact that all the guys, you know, in the, in the Pentagon back in the 70s, you know, beat their chest about not a pound for air to ground, you know, Mac Air is not stupid. When they when they built the airplane, you know they the, the F-15E was a gleam in their eye uh, the whole time. I mean they 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 had every intention, I think, of building a two seat dual role version of, of that airplane. Uh, so uh, so not surprisingly, you know, when the in the in the late eighties and and I can't remember what the request for proposal or whatever was put out, but the uh, the Air Force looked at the cranked arrow version of the F sixteen F sixteen XL and and at the uh, the uh, what later became the F fifteen E and they chose the chose the F fifteen E from those those two variants. Initially, they were going to build something like seven hundred airplanes, you know, which would have been glorious indeed. But of course, like so many other things, you know, the cost overruns and stretching out the buy or whatever, uh, you know, reduced it down to, to much, much less than that. Um, so that's kind of where the, where the airplane was coming from. We all uh, uh, report, well, I, I should say, I, I reported to Luke Air Force Base in February of 1988 uh, at that time, the I'm not even sure they the first airplane was being built yet, um, but uh, or, or I should say the first airplane that was going to come to Luke. They were probably building the 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 first two jets that went to went to Edwards. Um, but uh, so we started showing up in in uh, in early 1988. The initial plan, best laid plans of mice and men. The the initial plan was the was to divide that cadre of thirty two guys up into two groups, uh, the A cadre and the B cadre, and the the notion was that the A cadre would show up, they would be taught all the academics and and whatnot by whomever by the folks of the factory, et cetera, and uh, and check out in the airplane, get comfortable with it, and then those folks would then basically teach the syllabus to the B cadre to work out the kinks in the syllabus. And then at the conclusion of that, we'd have all of the, you know, we'd have all of the, the initial cadre checked out as instructors and we'd have the syllabus ironed out and ready to go. Good plan. Didn't work that way. <laughs> Instead, the, uh, the aircraft deliveries were, were delayed by, uh, you know, just a comedy of errors. I remember at one point, somebody drove a forklift into the side of one of the airplanes on the assembly line. Another thing was they, there's this tape that you wrap around bundles of, of, uh, of wire, uh, you know, to, to weatherproof them. It turned out that the adhesive was dissolving the insulation around the cables and, you know, they had to rip all the wire bundles out of some of the jets. I mean, there's, you know, it, it just seemed like every week we'd hear another story and we would just, you know, hang our heads and go back to the bar and cry in our beer about, you know, when are, when are our jets going to get here? Um, but, but nonetheless, that, that was the, that, that was the plan, but things started to slip to the right. Now it wasn't all bad because as soon as we got to Luke, there were there, at that time, there were, there were nine fighter squadrons at Luke Air Force Base. There was one reserve F-16 squadron, 
And then the 58th wing had four F-16 squadrons and the 405th wing had four F-15 squadrons, uh, all, all light gray uh, initially. And the 461st uh, attack fighter training squadron was the first to convert to the uh, uh, to the Strike Eagle. So initially, we were kind of a squadron with no jets. Uh, we did have a scheduling operation because, as you can imagine, uh, at at a at a place like Luke, where you know you had all those FTU squadrons, um, you know most fighter squadrons have only got a couple of two seat airplanes. The ratio was much higher at Luke because it was a it was a, a training base. So there were, you know, every day there were empty back seats, you know, uh, at Luke Air Force Base on both sides of the ramp, F-16s and, and f 15 So we just started scheduling uh, all of our guys that were hanging around with, without a lot to do uh, to fly sandbag rides. So it was, it was a good opportunity to one, get familiarized with the F-15 uh, for, for uh, uh, you know, for those of us that were going to be flying, you know, a variant of that airplane and then flying with the with the Viper guys, we got an opportunity to see all the Goldwater ranges and get familiar with local procedures and all that kind of stuff. So it was uh, I was I was telling a, a friend of mine early, earlier this morning who was also in the initial cadre, Frenchy Chambly, that when I left Canon, my buddies were all giving me a hard time because they're all jealous, but they're all saying, oh, you know, you're not going to fly for a month. So you're going to be sitting on your ass. Da, 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 da. And I, I showed up at Luke on a Sunday afternoon and I was strapping into an Eagle on Tuesday morning <laughs> and called and called back to the squadron and told them that. And they, they were just livid and fit to be tied. And then on Friday, I flew the Viper and called back and said, hey, I flew the F-16 today. And <laughs> you know, for, for a bunch of guys feeling trapped in the F-111, you know, they, were, they weren't happy that, uh, that I you know was flying that quickly. So, yeah, you basically in the, those early months, you could fly as much as you wanted. Uh, uh, and it, and I, I think I flew about 20 sorties in the light gray in in b's and d's and i flew another dozen sorties or so in the in the f-16 uh and that was all really good experience i mean you know transitioning into a glass cockpit airplane it was it was very useful to kind of fly in the viper and see how you know see how those guys uh did business uh and uh you know actually you know you could you know, in the in the d model viper you could actually do a lot of stuff you run the radar you know, the air to air and air to ground radar in the back seat. So I had an opportunity to, to learn some of that kind of informally. Talk a little bit about why the Strike Eagle, because you're an F 111 guy. Um, the F 111 is a very capable performer. The scenario, presumably, is the folder gap. So this is hordes of Russian armor coming in mm-hmm. through Central Europe to attack uh, Western Europe. Um, well, presumably it's a conventional war, maybe maybe tactical nukes, I don't know. Um, but why the Strike Eagle then? What was it that you were seeing in the Air Force at the time as an F-111 guy? What was it that Macaire... Because Macaire, you know, dual role fighter competition came through General Creech, who was the TAC commander. But as you said right at the beginning, Macaire knew immediately that there was a strike application for this, um, this mm. Eagle design. And they funded on their own dime the development of the Strike Eagle, which at that point wasn't called the Strike Eagle, but they funded that on their own dime. What were they seeing? What were you seeing? What was the requirement for this aeroplane? And and can you talk a little bit about the timing? So by the time U-32 initial cadre got together, was that a sort of prescient moment? Um, was that the right time for the Strike Eagle? Was it already a little bit late to do whatever it was it was supposed to be doing? What was the context? Well, I, I think the timing was good. The, the uh, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks a couple of weeks ago when I did the math and I realized that the Strike Eagle is as old today as the F four was when I started flying the Strike Eagle, <laughs> which is pretty terrifying. Um, but the uh, I mean, you know, the the, the F four was getting to be an old airplane. You know, the F four I never flew the F four. One of the great regrets of my life is I never got a, a sortie in the Rhino. Uh, but, uh, you know, the guys that flew it were, you know, loyal to it like no other airplane in history. Uh, tremendous airplane, but it was an old airplane. It wasn't going to last forever. And it was expensive, you know, when you tried to start uh, uh, tried to start strapping new digital capabilities onto the F-4. Uh, you know, there just there was a limit to what you could do, and, and really the same was true in the you know the two two of the models of the F one eleven had digital avionics, but but they just those airplanes just really weren't designed to evolve. You know, they were they were good designs when they were developed, uh, but they, but it was just very expensive and difficult to retrofit those airplanes with new capabilities. Whereas the you know the the Strike Eagle was kind of conceived from the beginning 
with a whole lot of flexibility, glass cockpit design, uh, you know, digital uh, uh, digital buses for talking to weapons and things like that. It, it just it it, it uh, you know it allowed the airplane to develop much more rapidly. Uh, as we'll talk here in a little bit about the, the concept of it's only software. It must be easy. Um, that uh, <laughs> uh, it just allowed the, the airplane to, to uh, evolve much more quickly as, as new capabilities came along. Now it's it's important to note when we started flying the striking, we were dropping dumb bombs. Um, you know, hell, our first night sorties were dropping under flares because we didn't have a, even have lantern yet. Um, so you know, it was you know we were doing pretty pretty stone age things with a with a high tech jet now that that it, again evolved rapidly targeting pods came along we started dropping lgbs uh you know the you know things change change rapidly there um you know in terms of what what did the what did the strike eagle offer uh, versus the f111 the, the, the big thing obviously was self defense capability you know the the f111 you know its defense was speed i mean yes we put aim nines on it you know, towards the the latter part of the the life cycle of the airplane, um, but you know nobody who's being honest <laughs> about flying the F one eleven would would tell you that that you had a, a terribly good self defense capability. I mean, you yes, if the, if a flogger rolls out in front of you trying to tap your leader, you might get an A nine shot on him. And you know, there's some great Ronald Wong paintings, you know, of what what I call the the fantasy Wong painting of you know going going down some you know notional Eastern European valley with a flogger rolling out right in front of you and an AIM-9 coming off the wing. I'm, you know, for all, all of you listening that have that painting, good on you. But, you know, let's face it, that, wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't gonna happen in anything less than perfect circumstances. So, you know, the Strike Eagle, which had, which had the, uh, you know, I, I will caveat, didn't have the same legs as a 111, did have pretty good speed. A lot of guys assumed that the, you know, nothing was gonna be faster than F, an F-111F, F, but Strike Eagle was pretty damn fast down low. Maybe not quite as fast as the, uh, as the uh, F one eleven F, but I, I would take the trade off of the maneuverability and the and the avionics capability. But you know the the combination of you know a really really capable air to air radar and AMRAMs and and still being able to haul iron you know uh, you know either up high or down low. And of course in those days we all thought we were going to go to war at low altitude and that all kind of changed in January nineteen ninety one after about two days of low altitude someone said wow this isn't working out great let's let's go back to what we did in Vietnam <laughs> and, uh, and that worked. Um, and I and I've, I've always I've always said that the Air Force deserves a lot of credit. You know, after just decades of training for a Eastern European scenario, uh, you know, with a very, very high air to air threat to turn on a dime and go back to medium altitude tactics um, in uh, in Desert Storm. But I mean, I'm getting a little little ahead of the story there. But um, so, yeah, I, I think it was I think it was the right airplane at the right time. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the airplane brought together a group of people from diverse backgrounds. We, we, you know, we had a, a, about five guys that came out of the F-15, you know, so obviously they, they knew the airplane, they knew F-15 air to air tactics, uh, they knew F-15 radar, et, et cetera. Um, you know, th that experience obviously was very valuable. We had two guys out of the uh, F-16, both of whom had flown the F-4, by the way, uh, previously. Uh, and those those two guys were both coming from Luke. They were R RTU instructors over at Luke. So they were bringing the, and, and by the way, everybody in the initial cadre had to be a current and qualified instructor in a fighter at the time they were selected, which was a clever move by some staff officer at, at uh, headquarters TAC because they knew, knew otherwise it was just gonna be a food fight of every general officer wanting to get their exact into the into the initial cadre. So now all, those guys all wound up in our first class, but the but the the instructors themselves had to be current and qualified instructors. Now there were one or two guys that were in staff jobs, but they were they were current instructors at the time they were uh, they were in flying flying staff jobs, in other words. Um, so uh, two guys out of the Viper, they brought the experience of coming from a glass cockpit airplane, which was was you know uh, that that was still a relatively new concept then. So that was uh, that was very very useful. Uh, two guys out of the A10, uh, and then the remainder of the guys were were pretty much split. The, the Wizos were a 50-50 split, six 
six F four guys, six F one eleven guys, and then the uh, uh, the remaining pilots were about a, a 50-50 split between one eleven guys and and F four guys. It's interesting. I there were Wizzos who were convinced that the the way to get into the Strike Eagle was to be an F four guy and get air to air experience, and then go to the F one eleven get air to ground experience, and then you were going to be teed up for the Strike Eagle. As it turned out, none of the Wizzos. Uh, you know, had flown both airplanes. They came from one or the other. They they were either F four guys or, or F one eleven guys. There weren't any Wizzos who who'd flown both airplanes. Now, I'm sure there were eventually other guys later on that converted. You know, from from one airplane to the other uh, into the Strike Eagle. But um, so that was kind of the group of people that we, that we got together. Um, really talented people. Uh, Type A personalities, strongly held opinions. I mean, we, I, I remember one air crew meeting where we had just this, I, I, I was kind of the avionics guy. That was, I was, my assignment when we divided people up and gave them additional duties is I was assigned to the academic squadron. So I was actually an attached guy for most of my time at Luke. So I was teaching academics. And uh, so I was really, you know, deep diving into avionics of the airplane because I was helping the people that were writing all the courseware at, a, at about the ten, about the time that we showed up at Luke, they were just converting to civilian academic instructors. So a bunch of old retired fighter pilots who were teaching academics. Uh, so I, I was working with a lot of those guys developing the, the courseware or whatever. So I was, you know, doing a lot of, of, of deep dives into avionics. And, and I had, and, and I spent a lot of time, a lot of time on the phone to St. Louis talking to the engineers about, you know, okay, this is, this is what the book says. Is that what, how, the way it really works? Uh, and oftentimes I discovered, no, it wasn't. I mean, there, there was an assumption that if, if we didn't tell you to change it, it didn't change. And that really wasn't true. I mean, the, the, the people at the, the people at the factory made a lot of, a lot of minor changes in the aircraft just because they thought, well, Hey, we're starting a new build. There's an opportunity to make things better. And they changed some things that took a while to get documented, uh, and, and figure out, um, so, uh, so anyway, I, I had this theory about, you know, the best way to align the ring laser gyro INS. And we, we, had, we must have had a 45 minute debate at the air crew meeting about how to align the damn INS. I mean, it was just, it was comical. I mean, how, j just how passionate guys were about, you know, getting it right in this airplane and, and, you know, figuring everything out that you could. I, uh, one of my favorite story, uh, memories in avionics, our, our initial academics were, was uh, for the for the A cadre that, that I, I, I referenced the A cadre and the, and the B cadre. The B, the B cadre guys just had later reporting dates. Uh, and those guys really did kind of get screwed because delivery slipped so much that, that you know, they, they showed up and waited a really long time uh, to start flying the, the Strike Eagle. But so the A cadre guys were going through the academics with um, uh, guys from the factory. We just had a week of death by academics, eight hours a day until your eyes glazed over with the engineers from Mac Air uh, telling you how the, how the airplane worked. And when they were describing system altitude, basically, how, how, does, the, how does the bombing computer know how high it is above the target, which is a topic that I later wrote my weapon school paper about. And I remember asking that question, and the and the and the engineer from from Mac Air kind of hesitated and went, uh, "That's proprietary." <laughs> and we just went, "Oh bullshit!" <laughs> it's like you, you are not going to tell us that you aren't going to tell us how this works, you know. <laughs> you know? And they 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 quickly uh, they quickly recanted on that, and and you know. Uh, spelled it out for us, but yeah, we we were just apoplectic. Like, no, <laughs> you know, we're we're paying for this airplane, and you will tell us how it works. Um, but the, so those, uh, you know, those academics were uh, um, were painful because it was it was just everything compressed into into a week. Um, and uh, but but you know, we we learned a lot, and then uh, and then we went in groups of uh, four guys, uh, two crews uh, at a time, we went out to St. Louis and we flew the developmental sim at St. Louis because that was the only simulator in existence. Uh, and it, it really, it was, a, it was more a simulator. It really wasn't designed for teaching emergency procedures or anything like that. It was designed for, you know, developmental stuff, avionics development and stuff. So it was, I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous simulator that, you know, I, I'm guessing most simulators today are, are the same type of thing, but, you know, you could, you know, shoot missiles, see smoke trails, 
see, you know, bandits blow up in front of you. I mean, it was light years better than a typical Air Force simulator at that time. Uh, so we, so we, uh, we, we did that uh, in, in groups of four uh, and came back and then started twiddling our thumbs and waiting for, waiting for our turn to check out. Uh, the, uh, the publications that we had, uh, we didn't get a uh, we didn't get an actual dash one an, an official Air Force dash one until about a week before we first started flying the airplane um, and uh, and quite frankly I, I think we probably would have flown it even if we didn't have that the the our, we all had a dash one for months and months which was a Xerox copy. Um, and it still had handwritten notes in the page. I'll, I'll never forget this. The, the paragraph on the HUD, I think the first sentence said, the HUD is the primary reference for instrument flight. And someone had written in the margin, USAF does not agree with this statement. Because <laughs> I mean, that was, a, that was a significant emotional event to say that you know, the HUD was a, the primary uh, flight reference. And um, and I and I, I I can't remember now whether that sentence stayed in when it was published or not, um, but it, there was a, a lot of uh, a lot of that. And, and the, the initial dash one was maybe that thick, and of course it was about that thick by the time I you know left the airplane. Um, we did not have a uh, a dash thirty four or any of the, the any of the avionic stuff. We had a document called the HEDAD, the Human Engineering Design Approach Document. Um, which is a title only a bunch of engineers could come up with, but that was describing, okay, how should it work? How, what's the human interface, you know, uh, for, for this glass cockpit design. So most of the avionics in the airplane, that was the heat ad was what you went to, to, to figure out how stuff worked. So we, we started to get the airplanes in, uh, in, I believe March was the, the first, the first jet was delivered to, uh, to loop uh, the wing commander who wasn't, wasn't going to check out the strike Eagle, but he, he went out to St. Louis and flew back with Gary Jennings, who was the chief pilot, uh, for, uh, Mac air at the time in his backseat, brought the first airplane out, we had a little ceremony when it arrived. We all, you know, as soon as the ceremony was over, we all scrambled up the ladder and, you know, waited our turn to, to you know, climb into that cockpit. And I will never forget that feeling when I, you know, I slipped into the back seat and I put my hands on those controllers. And it was like every time you touched them, you found a new switch. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, the old the old statement about playing the piccolo was, was true in, in, in the front seat and the back seat. Um, it was, uh, you know, we, we were just like kids on Christmas morning when we when we got to see that first airplane, which was 86186 was the was the tail number, which I'm told is in the boneyard now, which breaks my heart. Uh, that, that was the first airplane 187 uh, was delivered uh, maybe a month later. Those first two airplanes uh, flew a 38 ute, which is a utilization rate. Uh, so 38 times per aircraft per month. A typical, a typical ute rate in a fighter squadron would be, you know, somewhere between 15 and 20. So, I mean, we flew those airplanes hard. Now, bear in mind, we had an entire maintenance squadron to take care of two airplanes. When you came back from flying, I'll, this is this is great. You taxied into the chocks at Luke. And there were two crew chiefs standing there, each of whom had a bucket of hot, soapy water at their feet. And as soon as you landed, they were washing down the wheels, you know, to, to, to keep them clean. I mean, they, th those things were like Formula One sports cars. You know, the, you know, you can imagine the crew chiefs were as excited about having a new airplane as we were about having a new airplane. So they babied those things and took such good care of them. Uh, but they, they just flew magnificently. I mean, we checked out. We checked out half the initial cadre with just you know two or four airplanes. So I mean, they were they were able to to fly and, and held up really well. The other magical thing, which which a lot of the youngsters uh, are are intensely jealous of, is we didn't get conformal fuel tanks uh, until several months after we started taking delivery of the airplanes. So my first sorties in an, in an E model were in a clean E model. Uh, and you know, 220 motors. I, I later at Lake and Heath got to fly a clean E model with 229 motors, uh, and that is a tiger by the tail. But uh, the uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was it was kind of cool to get to fly the airplane clean, which obviously almost nobody gets to do anymore. But uh, uh, but we did. Uh, and in terms of how we flew the jet, I, I really got torqued here a couple of. Uh, 
about a year ago, maybe two years ago, uh, the the one star who was who was in some position at AppSoc, she'd previously been the wing commander here at uh, Kirtland, which is what the reason I recognize the name. And they were talking about bringing some, you know, some new uh, new aircraft into the inventory, it might have been one of their helicopters or something in AFSOC. And she was she was saying that, well, when we brought these previous airplanes in, I think she said when we when we when we brought in the F-15E, we flew it like an F-111. I went, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, that was a completely BS statement. Uh, we did not fly the Eagle like, like an F-4. We didn't fly it like an F-111. We didn't fly it like an F-16. We flew it like an Eagle. You know, and yes, it yes, we were flying it in a multi-role mission, but we flew it like an eagle, uh, and that was you know I think one of the things that that uh, was important is we didn't when we brought in this group of people with diverse backgrounds, we didn't we we tried to shed all of the as much as we could baggage and misconceptions, and you know this is the way things have to be done. You know, classic example. Uh, I, I spent a year as an as an RTU instructor in the F-111. Uh, during that time, I, I was a scheduler and I flew every, every time I could, I flew an actual student sortie. And I flew five sorties in a year with an actual student. Because the way the way the, the way the syllabus had ossified over the years was, you know, every the the first ride, the, the way the syllabus was was laid out for the F-111 at that time was you know, your first four or five rides as a pilot were with a were, were with an IP. And then and then, you know, then you could fly a couple of sorties with an IWISO. And then your last sortie in the phase, you could fly with your student crewmate. That's just kind of the way that the syllabus was was developed. And and in practice, it was like, well, he hasn't demonstrated proficiency in POPs. Well, he hasn't been to the tanker yet. I mean, there were there are just 101 reasons why the IWISO rides never happened. Um, so to get hours as, a, as an eye whistle on the 111, you had to go cross country in the weekends because you just weren't going to fly a hell of a lot with students. Uh, and I know because I, I mean, I was a scheduler. I controlled the schedule. I grabbed every student sortie I could. I did five in a year. When I showed up at, at Luke, I discovered that all these F4 guys, a lot of them as RTU instructors, they had, they had had to lead four ships from the pit. They had no desire. Maybe this is the difference between a tandem and a side by side airplane. The F-4 guys had no desire to fly in the backseat. They wanted, you know, the, so the, the, the objective of the of the syllabus that we wrote was, or and actually we didn't write it, it was written before we got there, was, you know, somebody was cleared almost immediately. As long as you're safe, you can now fly with an IWISO. Because, I mean, stop, stop and think about it. If you can do a formation takeoff solo in the, in the single seat F-15, certainly you can do a, a, sing, a formation takeoff with an instructor Wizzo in your backseat. So when we, when we transplanted that single seat mindset to the Strike Eagle syllabus, it, it meant that they could do almost, almost everything with, a, with an instructor Wizzo or with their student crewmate. So, so we, we just totally flipped the script and, and the syllabus from my perspective, which was to you know, get guys flying with a, uh, an instructor Wizzo and then flying with their student crewmate as early on in the syllabus as you could. So. For me, tremendously rewarding to go to Luke and actually start flying sorties with students and writing grade sheets on students instead of spending all day in the, in the scheduling shop. Junior, let me let me take you back then just to, to some of the things you've been talking about, just to explore them in a little bit more detail. So, so you you obviously, as you've described, went to St. Louis and you received the academics from them. Um, you were the avionics guy. Talk about the avionics. What did that airplane, what did the sort of 1988 version or 1989 version of the Strike Eagle have as uh, an avionics suite? Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the basics have not changed. You know, three displays in the front seat, four displays in the back seat. Um, and, uh, you know, flexibility in terms of, of where, where, you, where you put things. And, and at that time, it hadn't really been defined yet. Where, where, where do you, I mean, it was, it was a given that, you know, the, in the front seat, the radar was going to be the upper left-hand corner because that's where it was in a, in a C model. And, and that just seemed natural, but beyond that, uh, and, and in the back seat, it was going to be on the, on the, the large right display because most guys preferred to run the radar with their right hand. But, but once you got beyond that, I mean, there was just, 
you know, uh, the, it was a blank sheet uh, in terms of, you know, where, where do you, you know, how do you configure display? So, so that was, uh, um, I mean, there, there uh, I, I gave a speech a, a few years ago um, to one of the graduating uh, FTU squadrons at, uh, at Seymour. And I, and I had this list of, you know, things that you can't believe you, we didn't always have. <laughs> uh, you know, for example, the, the original RWR scope, uh, and our jets didn't have RWR equipment in them. We just had it in the sim. The original RDR, RWR scope just had 12 dots around it. That's it. Just 12 dots for clock, clock position. You know, the compass row, there were about, you know, 17 of us that all had this idea at the same time. Like, could we put a compass rose around the RWRs display so you can say spike 230 far? Um, that, that happened, you know, fair, fairly quickly. Having chaff and flare, initially, in order to inventory chaff and flares, you had to run a built in test. There was no display of quantity remaining in the cockpit. So, those were those are all things that, that you know, we added later on, like, could we get this? And, and the answer is usually, yeah, we can, we can add that, you know, nobody ever asked for it. So uh, that, that's why it's not in there. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the basic airplanes, uh, the, you know, the basic avionics were, you know, built, built around just like the original F-15, built around the radar. Um, and, and of course, in the, in the air to ground uh, mission, you know, we had to figure out time sharing the radar. You wanted the radar available for air to air search as much as possible. Um, but that, but that meant you had to kind of crew coordinate when are you, when are you going to use the radar for air to ground mapping and, you know, how do you, how do you crew coordinate when you're done with it, when you can, you know, pass it back. And, and typically, typically the backseat was running the radar in those days, uh, as the airplanes got more sophisticated with data link and, you know, lots of other, other things, you know, that's transition back to the front seat of running the radar. Can you describe a little bit the mapping capability of the radar then? So that's, it's an APG 70. Um, which is yeah, an outgrowth yeah. of the 63. Um, wh yeah. What is the relevance of that mapping capability? How does it work? How's it mechanized? What do you do in the back seat to map something? Well, it, it has it had a uh, it had a mode called real beam map, which was ju just like an, a, an old F4 F111 radar. Actually, it, in terms of resolution, was a lot worse than an F111 radar in real beam map, and, and that's just sweeping out in front of the airplane. And literally, the only thing we use real beam map for was you were in that mode for a couple of seconds, usually to just know that, okay, my, my, the, the point that I'm trying to map be at the target or an offset aim point is 30 degrees right of my nose. And, and, and I've got line of sight to it. If you're a low altitude, sometimes you had to climb a little bit to get line of sight. So you had one sweep of real beam map to say, okay, I'm getting radar returns underneath my, the symbology. I know I've got line of sight. Uh, and then you immediately would command a high resolution patch map. Um, that, that's a, uh, that capability, that at that time, the F-16 had a mode called Doppler beam sharpening. Uh, and I, I, I can't remember the specifics of how DBS work. There were two. There was like DBS one, DBS two, which gave you higher resolution. In in any kind of mapping thing like that, there's a trade off between the the computational time to produce the image and the uh, and the accuracy. You know, if you want more, more accuracy, it takes a little bit more time to produce the map. Our best accuracy was on a a, page, a patch map that was uh, two thirds of a mile square, uh, and it gave you eight and a half foot resolution. And you had to be inside 20 miles, 19 and a half miles, in order to uh, in order to to get that resolution. Uh, they, they, that may have since been extended on software updates, uh, and it's essentially the same same capabilities on the F-35 today. Um, but high, and this is one of my cl claims to fame because of a because of a class that I almost failed in college in lasers and optical engineering. Uh, I actually understood the theory behind. Uh, uh, high resolution uh, ground mapping and, and, and like, you know, on day four of that death by ac academics, as they were describing it, this light bulb went off and I went, I remember this. <laughs> I remember this college, four years of college didn't go to waste. Uh, so I, so one of my, one of my challenges early on was as an academic instructor was explaining, how does this radar work? Cause it, it wasn't like, you know, an, an old school radar of sweeping a sector, you know, that the radar just stared at a location. It took, took a series of pictures 
uh, effectively that most people can understand like a phased array radar that has that has multiple elements in it. And the way I described it as, as the aircraft is moving through space, it's taking a series of snapshots at each of those locations, each and then it's it's combining those as though they are different elements in a phased array radar. I used to walk across the stage in academics with a flashlight and I would just blink the flashlight every five feet as I walked and say, okay, now take all of those pictures that you just snapped you know, with the flashlight and then crunch them all together and boom, it produces a, a high resolution image. Um, the uh, HRM radar was nothing short of revolutionary. It was breathtaking you know the, the first the first time you saw an hrm image come up in the airplane it just brought tears to your eyes I mean, it was even when even when you'd seen pictures of it on tape i mean li literally you could you could take you could take an hrm image from 15 miles away of luke or gila bend and you could see the arresting cable stretched across the runway uh, you, you think about sort of tactical airspeeds, seven miles a minute, that kind of thing. You've got a 19 stroke 20 mile limit on the you know, 0.67, whatever the resolution was, the, the eight foot resolution map. Uh, that's only, you know, sort of two minutes flying time. Does that com does that compress things? And I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious to understand how when you first started to fly the Strike Eagle, then you developed the tactics that would be able to really take advantage of this technology because to me well, that sounds like a great capability yeah. but if you've, if you've only got a tiny bit of time and you've got to pop up and you've got a well, line of sight I, this this is a good example of how we you know we were lear learning by doing is the um the, the, the way you flew radar patterns in an f4 and f111 is you were you you flew on downwind and then you you know you turned base you know did a nice wide base and you rolled out on final pointed at the target and your radar was looking off the nose of the airplane and you found the target on radar and you tweak the cursors and, and drop the bomb. You know, the first few sorties in the, in the Strike Eagle, we were doing exactly that. You roll out on final, pointing at the, the nuke bull on the Goldwater Ranges, and you'd map the right conventional circle because it was you know was easy, easy thing to map. But it was only like, you know, 18, 20 degrees right of the nose. Now the, the HRM radar relies on Doppler shift. So directly off the nose of the airplane, it doesn't function. It has to be, you know, to, to the sides of the airplane. Um, and it, the, the first few times, first few sorties flying radar patterns, the, the target designation was always left or right. And we're like, oh, the airplane's all screwed up. And, you know, guys were, you know, bitching and complaining or whatever. And it, it was, uh, well, finally the light dawned that, there were because of you know there you didn't have perfect velocities the the map you know, the computation of the relative position of what you made the map of um because you could get a really pretty picture if, if velocities weren't accurate in the system you'd sometimes get a fuzzy picture but it was also possible to get a fuzzy picture or, or excuse me to get a beautiful picture but that just wasn't exactly aligned with where it thought you know the the Earth was. In other words, it had to be referenced to a you know a coordinate system to know that yes, that bright spot is in fact the target and not 100 feet you know left or right of the target. Well, it, it, we we learned that you know mapping something 20 degrees off the nose compounded that error, and that what you wanted to do was you wanted to map things 45 degrees off the nose, and you wanted to be going as fast as possible when you did it. So, you know, what, what used to be kind of a racetrack shape pattern for, uh, for radar bombing, what, what we do today is, you know, you crank the airplane around to, uh, to, to put the, you know, put the whatever you're going to map the target about 45 to 50 degrees left or right of the nose, accelerate as you're doing it to try to get to, you know, at least 400, 450 knots as you're making the map, make the map designate and then turn and point at the target so you know basically in, in the in a strike eagle by the time you point at the target you're done you're done with air to ground radar you know you've put the radar back into air to air to air mode at that point now if you've got other sensors like a targeting pod at that point you're now you're transitioning to the to the targeting pod to to acquire the target now of course this is all this is all irrelevant for guys that are slinging small diameter bombs from you know, 20 or 20, 30 miles away now, you know, the, the game has changed a lot from what we were doing, you know, back then with, with dumb bombs. But but you also had some, uh, I can't remember what it was called, AG, uh, AG something. It was uh, a mode where you could use the, 
you could sort of superimpose an ILS onto a, a runway, couldn't you? Where you could, so if you found oh, a runway. That was, yeah, that, that was, uh, uh, they made a big deal of that early on. And I, I never was never quite sure. We actually had a mode like that in the F-111D. Uh, and all it was was a synthetic glide slope. You basically you put the radar cursors over the over the touchdown point in the runway, and even even in the 111, you could break it. You couldn't break out the cable, but you could break out the cable housings. So you know to the left or right of the runway. So in in, in what was called an ALA in the 111 D, you typed in a glide slope. You put the cursors on what you wanted the touchdown point to be, and it generated a, a, a like a localizer and glide slope indicator. Uh, for the for the pilot to fly, you could do essentially the same thing in the uh, in the Strike Eagle just by designating that point on the runway. We almost never used it. It just I don't know maybe because we were in, in Arizona where it was always you know twenty five thousand thin scattered <laughs> seven mile plus visibility. <laughs> um, you know we we just didn't we we didn't use that mode very much. But it, it was the same idea. All, all you're doing is designate a point a point on the ground and the air the airplane is is developing a synthetic glide slope based on what you put in there. I, I remember what it's called. It's, it's ALGS, Autonomous Landing Guidance System. That's what it was called. And I, yes. I, I suppose I sort of think about... Your memory is better than mine. <laughs> which is, that's, <laughs> you should be worried because my memory is terrible. <laughs> um, but it did it did make me think about the sort of suitability again uh, and the design of the aeroplane with regards to that scenario, that follow gap scenario. And I, I hear it's interesting talking to a fighter air crew um, about things that engineers do, they put radar modes in that no one in the tactical world would ever want to use, so they get deleted in the next OFP. But um, but uh, but that one sort of struck me as being maybe sensible because I, I suppose if you're operating in Europe where the weather is notoriously bad and maybe you don't want to turn on your ILS for your military airfield, um, or if you're you know your 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 home base has been destroyed by a tactical nuke, maybe you want to go and find a civilian <laughs> airfield somewhere to land on. Then that that kind of thing made sense. But were, were there other examples of bits of software or logic or modes that that they had given you that um, you know may, maybe made a lot of sense and that you hadn't thought about or or didn't make much sense and and were therefore rarely used? Yeah, th- there were. Um, well, of course, I mean there were there were all kinds of air to air modes in the radar that, that uh, um, the, there was a, a, a great, great mode called Omar, uh, which supposedly was developed by a guy named Omar, which stood for own ship maneuvering angle ranging. It was a way to, to, to get range against a, 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 a noise jamming target or whatever. I don't, I don't know anybody who ever used Omar. <laughs> and there, there were, uh, but even even more common things that the, because uh, the, the radar had, it was much like, as you said, the, the uh, F-15C community had at least one squadron at Eglin flying with the APG-70 radar. Uh, and there was, a, there was an effort for a while to try to keep those two radar tapes pretty obviously there were parts of the e-model tape for the air to ground modes that, that the, uh, that the other guys didn't use, but they were trying to keep the air to air symbology, the same between those two communities. And it, it, it was a struggle because they were operating on a four inch display and we're operating on a six inch display. And, you know, you can put a lot more information on that bigger display. So they, they eventually kind of went our, went our separate ways on the, on the radar tapes. But uh, there were, for, for example, we had uh, uh, track while scan, Trackwell scan eventually developed some, uh, particularly what's called high data rate trackwell scan, uh, had some applicability uh, uh, when AMRAMs came online to, to be able to engage multi, multi-targets. Um, but uh, there, there was also designated and non-designated trackwell scan. I remember going out on this one story, the flight lead was an F4 guy and he wanted to, he had this grand plan. Okay. You know, you know, one and two are both going to be in non-designated track while scan slewed, you know, here or whatever. And I'm, you know, and I'm just sitting there going, this is, a, I was like, okay, I'll try anything once. But, uh, and, and that was one of the strengths of, of you know, of, of a bunch of, uh, uh, of guys flying a new, new airplane is we did try crazy stuff like that and, and it didn't work at all. I mean, it was, it was certainly not better than just, you know, being in normal air to air search and doing it the, the 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 traditional way, but we tried a bunch of that. So yeah, there, there were some there were some uh, air to air modes that that were just I, I'm I'm sure they I'm sure they seemed like a good idea, but but weren't really uh, they, they just weren't tactically useful to us. Um, air to ground wise, uh, 
you know, we had uh, CDIP for visual bombing and, and uh, auto mode for, uh, you know, for level loft uh, dive toss deliveries, what have you. Um, and, and we, I think we, we rung those out pretty good. I, 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 there's nothing that jumps to mind as something that we didn't, uh, that we didn't use. One one of the there was one unique mode to the to the radar, and, and again, this is something that I I championed early on, and I I took a lot of derisive comments from my colleagues for it. But the there was a uh, you you could do a precision velocity update. As I said earlier, the the accuracy of the radar mapping and the accuracy of weapons delivery was very much dependent on the 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 uh, uh, the system knowing its velocities, you know, very very precisely. Um, and there was there was a, a PV. There are actually three. There was an interleave PVU that it would take the radar away from you, you know, periodically to to update velocities. Nobody liked that. Nobody ever liked the idea of the radar deciding what to do on its own. Um, and uh, uh, and particularly, you know, anybody who was a, a you know air to air aficionado said, "I'm I'm not going to let this thing decide when it's going to take my radar away." Um, so no, nobody used that, but but you you could put it into you could do a quick precision velocity update, um, uh, and and th that was sort of procedurally before you before you did a a, a, a radar map you you did a velocity update, um, but there was also something called an INS PVU, and essentially that was really more of a maintenance function. Uh, it was designed to be an after you change the component on the airplane, if you change the you know the the radar antenna, the roll pedestal. The INS, you know, the the uh, uh, the, the uh, trying to think the central computer. I think if you change any of those thing, any of those components, you really had to go out and do this thing, which essentially required you to fly in a box pattern uh, with the radar in this mode, where it's just looking at the ground, measuring velocities, and and. When I initially started saying, you know, we ought to be doing these, everybody said, you're an idiot, you know, <laughs> the radar needs to be an air to air all the time. Uh, and, and we eventually figured out how to do it, you know, it, and it, it became part of tactical employment. You know, when you're in a holding pattern on the tanker or whatever, guys would, you know, you'd have a couple of guys in, in area search and other guys doing an INS PBU. And that just tightened up the tightened up the systems and, and gave you, you know, more accurate more accurate radar mapping and, and better bombing. Now, yeah, that, the importance of that has probably waned considerably with, with GPS guided munitions. Uh, but, but back in the day, it, it, it certainly did, uh, did make a difference to, to do those things. The other thing that, you know, the, the bit modes, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the radar would tell you more than you ever wanted to know uh, about, about what was going on and, um, you know, learning, you know, I, I, I saved the day on a, on a turkey, a night turkey shoot sortie one time because we took off and the radar was totally trash and just all kinds of false targets on it. And I said, let me take the radar for a minute. And I, I put it into this special in-flight bit mode or whatever. And my, my front seat was like, damn, I've never seen that before. <laughs> but it, it brought back the radar and it worked after that. So and we, we got some pretty good bombs. So, so there was a lot of learning some of those ins and outs of things that perhaps the engineers didn't envision as being a day-to-day tactical employment thing that we later learned now oh, that is, that's something that that we need to know and we need to teach uh, for people to to really you know maximize the the capability of the airplane just to be clear then on on exactly what your responsibilities are then in, in initial cadre I, I, am i right in thinking then so the airplane's been through developmental test it's been through then presumably operational tests so you know, the, the 422 at nellis have had it the 53 <laughs> ah okay so well, it, so where was it at <laughs> Not really. The the uh, the, the uh, OTNE was kind of going on. The it, it had been through uh, formally, I guess, what you would call developmental tests. Operational test was really going on near simultaneously. In fact, a, a guy named uh, a guy named Joe Fagan, who was the other EW in the in the initial cadre with me, he actually went TDY to Edwards for a year. Uh, they they needed another backseater out at Edwards. And uh, to do to do the operational test, and and they they needed somebody, and they needed somebody quick. And Joe said, "Okay, I'll go do it." Uh, so he went and he did two back to back six month TDYs uh, to uh, out to Edwards to to fly in the operational test. So they were they were still completing OT and E as we were starting to fly the airplane. Um, 
So were you doing Sorry. tactics development then as well? I mean, because I asked that question with the assumption being that you were developing tactics. but Well, the, the, you know, officially, no. Unofficially, hell yes. I mean, you know, we had a squadron full of target arms, flying a new airplane, trying new things. Uh, absolutely, we were, we were developing tactics. And that, and that was one of the really exciting things about the job is you weren't just teaching, teaching a syllabus you were, you know, you were figuring out the airplane, figuring out what's the what's the best way to employ it. So, so yeah, I, I would I would say we were developing tactics. So, so are you then taking something that can already be done by an F one eleven and an F four and doing it better, or are you doing something that those um, weapon systems cannot do? What 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 is the split in the well, in terms of what you're doing? Well, the the answer is is probably somewhere in between those two. I mean, in terms of the mission we're performing. It, it, pretty much the same missions that were performed by by those older airplanes. The flexibility that that uh, the, that you gain by having a glass cockpit, by having you know e- either guy could operate any of the sensors on. I mean, they, the only things that you had to do in the front seat were align the INS and turn on the radar. That's about it. I mean, well, once you know, once everything was powered up in the airplane. You, you could do virtually everything from either cockpit. So you could make decisions on phases of flight, who does what. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, er, early on, we're like, okay, if we're going to be down low, close to the ground, you know, I don't need the guy sitting in front of me looking at the radar. You know, I want him looking at the rocks uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll take care of the radar. Um, so, and that's kind of the way we, we divided up responsibilities. In fact, I used to, when I started teaching lantern academics, I, I I struggled to get guys to not spend all their time with a HUD repeater called up in the in the front seat and in, in the back seat. So I said, look, that guy sitting in front of you, he's looking at that 95% of the time. You don't need to spend all your time looking at what he's already looking at. You need to look at all the other stuff that he's not looking at. Uh, you know, so, but but it was, you know, the there, there was such great comfort in being able to see what was out in front of you in that display that most Wizzos wanted that up all the time. I, I encourage guys to kind of get in the habit of, you know, I, th- there was another sensor called the e-scope when you're actually flying terrain following radar. And that, you know, the e-scope would show you things in, in the radar spectrum that you didn't necessarily see in the IR spectrum. So I, I tried hard to convince guys you should be monitoring the e-scope and scroll over and look at the look at the IR imagery. You know, but basically, you almost never need to see the IR imagery. What, but there was a lot of information in HUD symbology that you could very quickly scroll over and glance at it and and you know uh, gain information. But but I used to tell guys don't don't stare at it because that's what the guy in front of you is doing. And as I remember doing my hundred foot checkout in weapons school, my front seater said. My cross, my cross uh, he said, my, my scan is going to be about 28 degrees wide. You got everything else. <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> don't hit anything. We're, we're good to go. So, um, so, so we spent a lot of time, uh, crew coordination. I I'll never forget teaching the initial crew coordination block. I were, uh, as I said, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the academic instructors were, were civilians, uh, and then, you know, at that time, you know, none of us had a lot of experience in the airplane. So I, you know, I, I, I worked a lot. I, I, I felt like I was in a test squadron because every time I stepped to fly in my early days, I had a lineup card with a list of questions from the academic instructors. Try this. Tell me how this works. So, I mean, you know, always on recovery, I would be heads down in the back seat, filming something, trying, you know, some weird combination of, you know, of inputs or whatever to, to see what the, how the jet reacted because the guys back in academics are trying to figure out how it worked. Um, so I, I spent a lot of, a lot of time doing that. Um, I spent some time arguing with some crusty old guys who insisted that, you know, no, the trackball scan works like this. And I'm looking, this guy, he was like an F5 aggressor. I'm like, I fly this airplane. I flew it yesterday. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> but there were there were some hard heads even even among the uh, the retired guys, but some but some great guys. We had a guy named Bill Lefever who had a MIG kill and Robin Ohl's backseat is one of our you know was one of my peer instructors. Didn't didn't feel like a peer, but uh, one of, one of my fellow instructors in the academic squadron was uh, had a had a MIG kill, which gets you a little bit of credibility when you're teaching the intro to air to air block, but. 
Uh, can, can we explore that a little bit more then, the, the impact of having, I mean, you, you said I think it was 26 or 27 uh, target arms patch wearers as part of that first 32. And, um, you know, talking about how to uh, end a debrief early is get those two to argue, get those two weapon school guys to argue. <laughs> but, 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 but what about then the impact that, you know, that expression, too many uh, chiefs, not enough Indians, probably politically incorrect. I'll probably get, I'll probably get cancelled uh, for saying that. But, you know, too many, too many chefs and not enough cooks. There we go. Let's go with that one. Um, what did, was there an element of that? How, how do you get things done when you have all these um, alpha personalities who have, um, you know, these patch arms and, and target arms and, and think they know best? Well, it... it uh... I mean, it's not like there were, uh, you know, I, I don't, I mean, every, every once in a while, you know, the ops officer or somebody would say, all right, you know, knock it off. We're going to do it this way. Let's try this. But, you know, by and large, we just kept trying things. And eventually, you know, the, 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 uh, the best tactics, techniques and procedures would kind of rise to the top. I mean, it, which is not to say we ever tried to come to, you know, one, one and only one way of doing things. Uh, but but over over time, the, the students would would kind of say, OK, I've listened to all these arguments on, on different ways to do this. And I've tried this and this is working for me and, and I'm going to do it that way. So, I, you know, I, I had some I had some some students say that, you know, towards the end of their their training going, OK, you know, hey, I, thanks for you know, th th thanks for giving us some tools of to the toolkit. I mean, and they were, and I'm sure there were, I'm sure they were, they were taught some techniques that they decided, no, nah, I don't want to do it that way. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we weren't, you know, we, it's, it's not like we were in a formal 3-1 tactics development process where we had to come to some sort of resolution. I mean, that, that would all happen much later, but, but it was really just sort of a, you know, kind of letting the cream rise to the top of, okay, this, this technique is, has been adopted by, 60 or 70 percent of the people in the squadron and it seems to be working well so we're going to start kind of teaching that as the the school solution if you will well, what other methods of validation are there then so you, you obviously you have consensus as you've described but were you able to go out and fly the airplane against other communities were you taking it to red flag what what, what other ways could you validate what you were doing my my first my uh i, I think i had uh, one or two bfm rides and uh, there, there were a total of uh, total of 12 sorties in the checkout uh, for the initial category, 14 for pilots, 12 for WISOs. Uh, there was like one TRAHC ride, four air-to-air -air rides. I think I had two BFM rides, which, which included some intercepts. Uh, and then the next ride was 1v2 against Marine Corps Kafirs uh, out of Yuma, <laughs> which is you know, something normally normally you'd have to wait until much later in your in your uh, operational career to, to do that. But uh, uh, yes, but at that time, we, you know, we would take anything we could get for adversaries. Uh, and uh, so the Kafirs wanted to fight and we said, OK, let's go do it. So it was kind of kind of fun for me as somebody who was brand new to, to air to air. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we didn't uh, we didn't have a lot of opportunity to do dissimilar stuff. We we did we did go out and and, and fly uh, dissimilar against Vipers at, at Luke. You know, we did a lot of you know from from really from the get go. There was kind of a monthly turkey shoot at uh, at Luke, and and we would. Uh, you know, just because you're flying almost entirely student training sorties and turkey shoots are some of the few, you know, just instructor continuation training sorties that, that we had. So we were, we started flying in those early on. And, and uh, so, yeah, we, we had plenty of opportunity to, to uh, uh, fly dissimilar against the F-16. I flew, flew against F-18s uh, from El Toro uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, so, yeah, we, we had, we had some ability there. Um, to, uh, uh, to to ring the airplane out early on, where it, where it really uh, you know the uh, the first real opportunity that we had, um, and this kind of goes to how the 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 B, the B cadre who who later labeled themselves the B scum <laughs> because they were waiting so long to get checked out. The uh, we, we were supposed to start our first TX course uh, in uh, I believe in December of eighty eight. Uh, and we convinced them to push it off until like January or February of 89, uh, because they just said, hey, look, we, we need to get more experience with the airplane. We need to get more comfortable uh, with what we're doing and just get some more hours before we start teaching this to to a real course. And, and that that argument held. So we uh, the first time we deployed was November of 88. I think it was November of 88. 
uh, for what was called all aspect adversary counter tactics, which is part of the part of the uh, um, AIM-120 uh, OT&E. Uh, and we deployed up to Nellis for that. We were HEARS only. Uh, one of the exciting things is we actually got RWR gear. They had some extra LRUs at Nellis and we slapped them into our jet. So that was the first time most of us had ever flown with real real RWR in the, in the aircraft. Uh, well, we were AIM-9s only. We weren't radar radar missile shooters, but still it was, it was great. You know, great. It was, you know, uh, doing some uh, doing some night flying. And then about a month and a half later, we went back uh, for the first uh, night, it was the first first red flag the Strike Eagle had ever had ever played in, and it was the first night red flag in like ten years, um, and that was a hoot uh, because you had an entire generation of Eagle drivers. You know, the guys who were flying Red Air uh, were uh, I think it was the Twenty Seventh Squadron out of Langley, and you know, because none of the seasoned Eagle drivers wanted to go fly at loop, or, excuse me, fly at night. So they said, yeah, send, send the lieutenants on that one. So, so you had a bunch of, a bunch of relatively young and experienced guys who had never in their young lives ever encountered a striker that had a radar missile capability because the, the, you know, the F4 had gone out of the inventory, you know, when they were, when they were coming in brand new or, or was, was all but gone out of the inventory. So the only thing that they'd ever fought was an F16 with an AIM-9. Uh, so a striker coming in low altitude, with an AIM-7 capability that could shoot back um, was was an eye-opening experience <laughs> for a lot of those kids. Um, so yeah, we we had a you know that that was really really an opportunity to ring out the airplane and 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 figure out you know how how are we going to employ night low altitude as radar missile shooters um, and uh, and and uh, you know really fully exploit the airplane and that was uh, that that was a that was a tremendous red flag that that you know is is now uh the subject of much lore among the initial cadre our squadron commander was a guy named skip bennett um and uh skip uh, who, who oh, by the way was a good good friend of paco geisler's and uh you know skip bennett's the, the you know what he's passed away now but you know we, hopefully is carved on his tombstone was everybody give me 20 bucks we, we showed up at uh we showed up at, at, at the red flag building and again, you know, an entire squadron of patchwork. And by, by that time, you know, two thirds of the squadron were majors or lieutenant colonels uh, and everybody's a patchwork. And we we're sharing the room in the red flag building with this bunch of lieutenants from an OV-10 squadron at, at DM. And uh, and as we, we we came in on Sunday morning for death by briefings and, and we came out of the first hour or two of death by briefings. And that's when Skip Bennett said, hey, I got a great idea. Everybody give me 20 bucks. <laughs> so he collects, you know, a few hundred dollars, hands it to our lieutenant adjutant, you know, sends her, you know, off on her mission. And when we come out of the, you know, the second hour of death by briefings, you know, we've got Bloody Mary mix, you know, we've got we've got the, the bar set up, you know, celery stalks and the whole nine yards. So we're all we're all walking around the red flag building at, you know, about noontime on Sunday, sipping our bloody Marys and you know, planning for uh for fam day at red flag, and everybody's looking around going, Who are those guys? <laughs> It was it was a lot of fun. I mean, there there were you know brand new airplane, you know very, very experienced group of people flying the airplane, and then you know we uh, we we I think we acquitted ourselves pretty well at Red Flag. It was a really a really good introduction to the rest of the of the tactical community of what the airplane could do. So it, it feels like. Um... Well, I suppose when you look at the aeroplane, you look at what it's designed to do, <clears throat> fight its way into the target, kill the target, fight its way back out if it needs to, um, be self-sufficient. There's a huge amount that you've got to cover uh, in your role there as, as initial cadre. And I'm sort of getting the sense that really, you know, there's a shared load in developing those tactics. So you might have the 422 doing their thing. You've got the developmental test at, at uh, Edwards doing their thing. You're, you're creating... <clears throat> a new set of of uh, strike eagle pilots and wizards who are going to go off and form the first operational squadron frontline squadron um, and they're going to start developing and, tactics and, and as went well. to and went to war about a and year go to later. war <laughs> so, so how do you, how do you prioritize what you do because uh, there's so much to it there's night there's low level there's i don't know if we were taping when when uh, when we talked about it earlier but the you know shift from low altitude to medium altitude um, mm -hmm. there's those capabilities as well there's an incomplete set of 
um, sort of avionics in the aeroplane in terms of no radar warning receiver, no lantern yet, no night um, TF mm. capability, no night vision capability. How do you, how did you prioritize what you were going to do? And, and can you give us an example then of, of how you solve a challenge? I mean, it could be that low-level night um, AIM-7 shooter challenge. What are the challenges? How do you get good at it? What have you got to be careful about? What's the experience like? Well, uh, the... the uh, um we, we, the, the 422 was kind of standing up and, and getting their airplanes about the same time. So they're, uh, and of course, they, they didn't have any more experience in the airplane than we did. So, so uh, there, there was there was a lot of good dialogue with those folk those folks up there as they were as they were uh, uh, you know finishing up the developmental stuff and then kind of hand, handing off from the the initial ot e that was done done out of at Edwards at that time because I, I don't I, I can't remember when Nellis got its first jet. Because I, I want to say the first two jets, we uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, we had E four was our was our first airplane one eight six. Uh, so there were two jets at Edwards and one at Eglin um, when when we got our first airplane. So Nellis didn't get their jets; they they got them not too long after we did. But they were you know they they were kind of marching along in 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 parallel to to develop stuff. Of course, there really really wasn't a three dash one, and I I, uh, I I honestly can't remember what the things were on their plate early on but um as we were uh the the, the syllabus i mean we, the, the shorter answer is basically we, we were following the syllabus that was given to us um with, with you know maybe maybe some minor tweaks but the 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 rtu syllabus ftu now uh was was about 50 50 air to air and air to ground uh there was a lot of a lot of griping from some of the leadership um, in the operational wing, in the fourth wing at Seymour, that we were too focused on air to air. But you know, you've got to, you know, it, it it's however many sorties it takes to make a guy safe and proficient in the airplane, uh, and you're trying to teach two different roles, air to air and air to ground. Um, and uh, and you, you know, you need to learn both. I I, I saw some guy made a a uh, post on Facebook about a week ago uh, when the e-models are current, Seymour e-models are currently deployed in Estonia for NATO air policing. Someone's like, wow, e-models flying air to air. Things must be really bad. I'm like, hey, jackass, e-models have been flying air to air since 1990. <laughs> you know, sorry you missed it. Um, but yeah, and then the, in the, you know, there are lots of guys from Seymour that flew six hour cap missions uh, over Iraq, you know, uh, in the aftermath of Desert Storm. So there's nothing new about e-models flying air to air. Um, so, so we kind of, you know, we just sort of followed the syllabus. And as you said, we didn't have a lantern early on. So the night portion of the syllabus was really curtailed. I mean, it was just going out, you know, bombing, you know, visual, you know, doing ra radar level uh, levels and lofts. Uh, we actually did, I, I, yeah, I have to get this story in. When we first got lantern, but before we had the targeting pod, uh, we just, we got the nav pod and we were checking guys out to do uh, low altitude TFR, and we actually did direct pops, which is fly straight at the target, pull up at about five miles to 30 degrees nose high, roll inverted, you know, pull down through the horizon to about 20 degrees nose low, or, you know, 15 degrees nose low, start to roll out. And ideally, you'd roll out 15 degrees nose low with the with the target and the FLIR. And I, you know, I'd, I'd done dozens and dozens of these with other instructors as part of the lantern checkout. First time I did that with a second lieutenant in my first in my front seat, I'll never forget. As that nose passed the horizon, I said, "I am not getting paid enough to do this shit. <laughs> this is scary." <laughs> Pointing your nose to the ground, low altitude at night is a scary business. But uh, but that's you know we were we were very definitely training for you know low altitude employment. That that's what everybody assumed the next war was going to look like. So that's that's what we what we focused on. Um, and I, 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 I'll probably get my dates screwed up, but I, I want to say it was the summer of 19. No, no, I think it was the summer, summer of 89 is when we first got the, the nav pods and started getting everybody checked out. And I was the, I, I went to, I went to Edwards and got lantern ac academics from the, the guys that were flying it in the test community. And then I came back and taught lantern academics to, to everybody at, uh, at Luke. Um, so we, so that, then we were able to start really getting into night employment of the airplane, flying around low altitude, night formation, figuring out formations. That, that was the other big thing is what kind of formation are we going to fly? And, and, 
you know, in, in the 111, you were going to be, you know, eight mile trail or something like that. But obviously, you know, we didn't feel the need to do that with the FLIR. You could, you could fly, you know, kind of an offset, uh, you know, with you keeping the, keeping your lead, you know, just, just at the edge of your HUD field of view or, or, or slightly outside the HUD field of view. Again, all, all that's changing now with data link and, and night vision goggles, you can fly much more aggressive formations, but just figuring out how we were going to fly night formation uh, with Lantern was, a uh, you know, very, very different from the way it was done in, in F4, F-111 days. Can, can you talk a little bit about the process then for figuring that out? So, I mean, if you, you take that then as the, as the example, what do you do? You just schedule a load of sorties, you've got a certain amount of time, you've got to figure it out, and then you've got to move to the next uh, item on the syllabus. Uh, how, how do you figure out you know, where to spend your time and, and what's the process then for actually coming up with answers to the questions? Well, we, we uh, well, for example, let, let, let's take night, night formation. When we first got Lantern, you know, we just, you know, as instructors had to sit down and go, okay, how are we going to do this? What formation are we going to fly? Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't a lot of, you know, a lot of the OT and E stuff had been done single ship. So there wasn't, uh, there, there, it wasn't like there was a, any, font of knowledge to go to on, on how to do it, you know, uh, uh, at night with Lantern. So we, we just started, you know, saying, okay, let's go out and try this. So the, you know, the, the initial few sorties would have been all instructors, uh, you know, trying it out. And if we found something, something that worked, then, then that would kind of populate, you know, we were sort of, you know, getting, you know, but by the time we finished getting everybody through the Lantern checkout, you know, we'd kind of come to a, you know, come to a consensus about how we how we wanted to do most things. So, so we had a reasonable uh, reasonable de- uh, degree of agreement on tactics by the time we started teaching it to to other students. You know, to what I would call real real students. So, so what sort of things would you be looking for then? What what are the uh, the metrics or the criteria you're looking to make sure that you can till you can continue to visually support one another in in a given given formation in the dark? That obviously you don't hit the ground. That's a bad yeah. thing. Well, yeah. As 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 radar missile shooters, I mean, you you, you know, the closer the, there's a reason why the wall of eagles is the standard F-15 employment tactic. You want everybody up where they can shoot. You know, near near simultaneously. So. Um, now that, that's less of a concern night at low altitude, but, but the idea of being relatively close to your leader, if you were both going to potentially employ radar missiles was, a uh, was a consideration as opposed to the, you know, eight mile trail or whatever that, that would have been more, uh, normal in the, in the, in the F-111 days. Um, so that, that was, uh, that was a big part of it is trying to, you know, trying to mirror our daytime tactics as best we could. Now, obviously, 6,000 feet line abreast wasn't going to work terribly well. I mean, you could, you could probably do that today with, with night vision goggles, but uh, um, uh, so, so that's kind of what we were, we were driving towards. And then uh, of course you've got to, then you've got to deconflict once you get to the target area, you know, you, you know, are you going to, are you going to deliver simultaneously to be outside? Again, all of this goes away at medium altitude. If you're at low altitude, now you've got to worry about deconflicting, so you're not flying through your leader's frag. Uh, so you've got to either do that with you know horizontal spacing, vertical uh, vertical spacing, or time. You know your three options to to deconflict. Um, so we uh, you know we we just started figuring out, you know, what's the kind of the way we, way we did everything, you know, bringing in experience for, from all the, all the various different aircraft and, and, uh, uh, and, and trying different things to, to see what was going to work. Um, yeah, I, I'm not answering that question very well. I wish I could remember better. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of brain cells killed in that summer of 89. I can tell you. It's very, I mean, it's summer in Arizona. So the sun wasn't setting until 9 p.m. And so you can imagine there was pretty late debriefs on those, those initial lantern sorties. It's not, it was not a time of year you normally would have chosen to fly nights, but we, we needed to get everybody checked out. So uh, there are a lot of, there are probably a lot of good ideas that drowned in a glass of beer during the debrief. So. <laughs> Well, what about uh, the the different um, perspectives then of the the communities that came together to form that initial cadre? There, so you talk a lot about air to air as an F one eleven D guy. Presumably, you had almost no air to air experience. Um, you know, no, no, nothing to speak of. And then you've got the, those sort of F fifteen C guys that are coming across who know the Eagle, who won't have any, who maybe not, maybe didn't have any air to ground experience, or certainly had a a bent towards the air to air side of things. Did did that uh, 
was that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, well, oh, no, I'm, I, I'm I think giving I you a binary good. choice, but uh, yeah, no, it, 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 was, it was a good thing because I mean, everybody. I mean, certainly, I came into it knowing I got a hell of a lot to learn about air and air, uh, and I, you know, I, I kind of latched on to a couple of other instructors who were, you know, guys that that I clicked with that were that that did understand air to air and were willing to take a little extra time to mentor me uh and 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 get me up to speed and and kind of the the same thing with with air to ground stuff there were guys that were you know you know far more experienced in air to ground and and there was uh you know despite the the titanic egos that we had in that squadron you you had to have a willingness to you know occasionally put your ego aside and learn from your peers uh or would kind of defeat the whole purpose of being there and i think most guys were were pretty pretty good about that i mean there were there were you know certain people that were incredibly hard headed about certain things uh but by and large you know most people were willing to to say okay let me let me be the student here for a little bit and and you know learn something learn something new you you shared uh, your speech you gave a speech at uh, i think it was the air force academy or, or, or what's he? Oh no, 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 it was at Seymour. It was at FDU. Was that, was that, okay, that was the FDU. Okay, and you, and you, there were a couple of things in there that that, that I sort of um, smirked at. Uh, one and one of them was <laughs> that's good. Was, it was intended to be, intended to be a funny speech. So. <laughs> but, but one, one of them was was reference to teaching the C model guys some things. Um, do, do you remember? Um, what, do you remember what was in your speech? And do, you, do, you, do you remember what those things were? Can you can you talk a little I, bit about that? Uh, the, well, there, there were some, uh, yeah. And, and, and believe me, this, this is not to slam anybody that flew the C model, but we lost a couple of airplanes in, in, in my mind attributed to somebody who with experience in a C model, expecting the airplane to fly exactly the same way. And it, and, and in a lot of ways, the airplane flew the same, the, the crucial difference is that with conformal fuel tanks on the airplane, heavier, just not as much pitch response. I mean, it, it, it did it, it did give you initial pitch response. I can't remember exactly what the Dash One said about this, um, but but certainly more sluggish in roll, more roll inertia. But the key thing was in, a, in an F-15 light gray, if you neutralize the stick, the angle of attack reduced immediately. So, you know, if you neutralize the stick, you could put in full aileron and a boot full of rudder and roll that airplane in a heartbeat. The Strike Eagle just won't do that. I mean, eventually it will, but, but you had to neutralize the stick and kind of wait one potato, two potato in order for the angle of attack to, to get back down to where you now had that, that roll response. And, and we had a couple of departures um, that were C model guys that were in that you know, high angle of attack situation, you know, very aggressively maneuvering the airplane and, and kind of expecting it to do what a C model did. And it just won't. I mean, th th so that was, that was one of those, you know, it was really subtle. You, you know, you, you had to, you just had to kind of break that habit pattern is you, you're used to being able to instantaneously uh, command that role. And you just can't do that with conformal tanks. You've got to, you've got to give it a second or two you know, for the for the AOA to come down, just you, you had to pay more attention to your, to your AOA. The other thing that we learned, you know, one of the last things I did before I retired, uh, I was the uh, the mishap board president for the uh, uh, the airplane that went down in, in uh, Libya during Operation Odyssey Dawn. I got to be careful what I say because that's a safety board and it's privileged information. But but one of the things that we learned, you know, as part of that action board, we went back and looked at all of the departures that, that we've had in the in the F-15 community, you know, since the since the A model days. And and the uh, uh, the the high angle of attack uh, is is you know th that, that's where things get dicey in the in the eagle and particularly when you've got lateral asymmetry. Um, you know, the, the airplane becomes much more departure prone. But one of the things that, that was not appreciated at all early on is there, there are two things that really increase the departure susceptibility of an F-15. One is a centerline tank and the other is the two place canopy. And the, the and which is surprise. You just wouldn't intuitively, I'm not an aeronautical engineer, but you wouldn't think that that canopy 
difference would make that big of a difference, but it does. It, it makes the uh, it makes the airplane you know uh, considerably more departure prone. Um, so you know if you're flying a, a two you know two place E model with that canopy and a lot of lateral asymmetry, or, or even a little bit of, of lateral asymmetry, you just had to be very careful about what you were doing with the airplane at high AOA. You just had to pay pay more attention to to what your angle of attack was. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an aeronautical engineer. I'm an electrical engineer, not an aeronautical engineer. But uh, I mean, part, part of it is that when you get to very high angle of attack, it starts to wash out the tails. And now that the tails are no longer providing you directional stability, that's that's you know kind of where the uh, and, and the airplane when we when we first started flying the Strike Eagle, well, when we first got it, uh, we had no CFTs. We were limited to to 7.3 Gs. They just whatever reason they hadn't released it up to the full nine G's. Well, unfortunately in a symmetrical pull, the first beep that you get on the, on the uh, overload warning system is a 7.3 G, it's <laughs> at 80%. So, so if you ever heard the beeper, you'd over G. So the, the, the whole, the whole standard, you know, BFM of, you know, okay, pull to the single rate beeper, pull to the double rate, ease off. You couldn't do that in the early days because you were over G. Um, so, so we had we had to we had to fly the airplane a little more uh, a little more gingerly until until those uh, uh, those restrictions were removed. Um, that is a point I was going to make about that. Uh, I've lost it. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, while you, while you sort of maybe retrieve it from the depths of your mind, quick question then about flying it from the back seat: Was there any um, practical uh, sort of element of of you learning to fly the airplane uh, they put a stick and throttles in the back of it for a reason uh, do you know what the reason was uh, <laughs> I, I, that's I, the way god intended <laughs> <laughs> I, I, a, a memo a memo that never got to the united states Navy. <laughs> um the uh I, I would say uh, I, I, obviously it made it you know much easier for a, an instructor pilot to teach a new pilot when you had full control controls in both cockpits. I, the the uh, the short answer I would give you is is aircrew fatigue. Uh, I mean I, I flew some you know I, I flew some combat sorties back in '99 from Lake and Heath where we were flying six hour missions and you know flying on the wing of a tanker for hours and hours and hours is fatiguing and and it is you know it pays to be able to trade off between you know uh between both guys in the airplane on long long duration sorties like that you know F f-16 guys when they're crossing the when they're doing an ocean crossing they're gonna spread out you know miles line of breast and put the autopilot on uh so that they can you know they can get a, a break from you know just sitting there trying to, to, to maintain formation position the whole time, you know, and then in the e-models, you know, you say, okay, it's time to let the back seater fly, you know, so we tended to fly a little bit closer, closer together on ocean crossings and stuff, because you, you could take, take turns with, with both guys flying the airplane. It really wasn't to fly the airplane tactically, you know, in a, in a, uh, uh, in an operational scenario, but certainly for administrative coming and going, you know, both guys being able to fly the jet was a, a big plus on long duration missions. Were you teaching the airplane uh, in conventional and, and nuclear roles? Did the, the nuclear role come later? Or? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I think we did a, we might have done a nuke sim at Luke, maybe, um, but not much. I mean, it was just m most of the units weren't going to need it. Uh, so it was, you kind of, I mean, the, the, the only, the only thing that was really different, you know, m most of the, m most of the nuclear delivery procedures got nothing to do with flying the airplane. It's just all kinds of command and control and all, all that sort of stuff, you know, actually delivering the, the weapon. If, if it was a, if it was a weapon that had permissive action link or PAL, then you had to have the procedures to, to, to PAL enable. Well, actually the, 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 uh, there, there were th there were things that the strike eagle could do from the cockpit that ultimately NATO said, you know, "We're not going to let you do that. We're going to pile weapons on the ground because that's the way the that's the way the uh, European countries do it." So, um, so, but but yeah, you could you could uh, uh, pretty much everything that was different about doing a nuke delivery you could do in the simulator. You just had to work, you know. The, there was a whole different armament system for for mm -hmm. nukes, or a subset of the armament control system for nukes, and it just it was, you know, a whole bunch of laborious steps, which really weren't that weren't that hard. They, I, when they, I remember when they taught that to us in that first week of academics, and everybody's eyes are rolling back in their back in their head because it seemed so complicated. 
And this one guy, Roger Turcott, who was who had uh, he he'd flown nukes in his his F four days, I think, and, and was a, one of the two F sixteen guys. And he goes, "It's not that hard. You just keep just keep pushing buttons until shit happens." <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not the way nuclear delivery is supposed to be done. <laughs> I think you're supposed to know what you're doing. Um, but yeah, so so we didn't have to spend a lot of time on that. I mean, particularly back in the R2 days. I, as I said, I, I think it might have been one simulator, but the, most, the sims were pretty much all being done by the civilian uh, contract instructors. So we didn't we didn't have to spend a lot of time learning that. And, and, man, and many of the initial cadre would have balked at the idea that they should ever learn that. <laughs> one, one thing I haven't really uh, discussed is the, the operational unit. Uh, I mentioned it. The, the first operational wing was the fourth wing at Seymour Johnson. Um, there, there was some tension, <laughs> to be sure, uh, between what we call the east of the Mississippi and the west of the Mississippi Air Force. Um, you know, we, you know, we had the luxury of, uh, you know, being out at Luke, uh, dealing with a syllabus, which was, you know, 50% or, or better air to air, uh, and, and kind of being free to, you know, uh, to, to do a little bit of informal tactics development. And, you know, as, as we saw it set the direction of where the airplane could be going, um, back at Seymour Johnson, you know, they were, you know, they were, uh, under the thumb a lot more. Uh, there, there's a famous story about uh, one of the squadron commanders at uh, at Seymour who had been one of the students in the in the first class, um, who was a, a handful as a student. Uh, but anyway, he uh, when somebody said, "Hey, we're a dual role airplane," he goes, "You're dual role, all right, day and night bombing." Um, you know, the 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 the, per, the perception of the leadership there at Seymour was, "We are here to." Uh, we're here to be a bomber. If, you, if you've never seen, there's a great tape from way, 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 but you know, many, many years ago, the F four days um, uh, about the F four that was filmed out at Red Flag, and it's got this long thing. McDonnell Douglas, you know, uh, uh, supersonic twin engine fighter bomber, mostly bomber. It, it's a it's a song, and, and you, it, if you go, I, I'll see if I can find it on YouTube and send it to you. But it was it was kind of it was it was sort of you know the, the F four guys. There were a couple of F four squadrons. There were dedicated air to air squadrons, but most of the F four community were you know were uh, were there as uh, to to do the the attack role or the fighter bomber role, and and uh, uh, and and you know air to air is always considered the cool guy thing to do. You know, so guys resent it when they they don't get to do that as much. But the uh, um, you know, clearly uh, the Seymour leadership had been told, um, one, don't lose any airplanes. And, and there was a, I guess there's a perception that flying aggressive air to air, you were more likely to have a midair or something like that. And, you know, focus on, on you know, your primary role of, of uh, uh, night ground attack. So, uh, or day and night ground attack. So, so that that did kind of lead to this little bit of a split between the the philosophy east and west of the Mississippi, uh, and and you know, guys, we we would, you know, we would train guys up and you know do their their final flight was a opposed surface uh, attack tactics ride, you know, with red air whenever we could get it, and 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 you know all that kind of stuff, and then they would go, uh, you know, back to Seymour, and it was oh no. We're not we're not doing all that air to air stuff here. You know, we're we're focused on the air to ground mission. And that was that was frustrating for you know for a few guys. There were a couple of guys that jumped ship as soon as they could and came back to Luke as RTU instructors <laughs> to uh <laughs> to uh build up Grego and, and Denny Peoples, the first two guys I remember that 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 came back. And it was good to have some guys coming back from the operational wing, uh, but but there was certainly a perception that we were the 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 cuffs were off us much more in terms of what we were allowed to do with the airplane uh, compared to, to, to Seymour. Now, I, I can't I, I can't fault the leadership at, at Seymour. You know, I've been a squadron commander now. I, I know what it's like. I know sometimes you get guidance from on high that, you know, here's what your priorities are and you salute smartly and you do that. Uh, and certainly it was proven, you know, that wing went to war a year later in Desert Storm uh, and, and performed magnificently. So, so, you know, clearly they were, they were doing the right things to, to bring, the, bring the airplane on uh, operationally. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, it was only a few weeks after Desert Storm ended, they were loading up AIM-7s and flying cap over Baghdad. So, <laughs> you know, those, those air-to-air skills were important. They, they really were important. So. 
I was going to ask then, I mean, there are a couple of things we, we, we've got to get back to. I, I'm, you know, sort of the software evolution um, you mentioned right at the beginning. We haven't talked about that either yet, so we, we definitely got to come back to that. But but because you mentioned it, I was going to ask it later in our conversation anyway. You, you did go on to Commander Squadron uh, Strike Eagles here at Lake and Heath. And um, by that point, the airplane was much more mature than it was in the days we're talking about, the late late eighties. Um, but what philosophically, or how philosophically, do you feel about that dual role mission? Uh, how practical is it to say the strike eagle, you know, blows up what's um, you know shoots down what's up and blows up what's down? Uh, you know, what, what what is the what is the reality? Is it that at various points in a squadron's history, it will be strong in one role because that's where it's placing its time and spending its time training, and and that's where the emphasis is. Or is there truly a, a multi-role capability at any given point in time in, 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 let's say, the modern era? Let's say, you know, the sophisticated battle space of today. Well, I mean, obviously, my, you know, the last time I flew the airplane was 2008. And the last time I, I, uh, I was in the sim in 2011 in the Sweet 5 configuration. Um, so it, it's, it's evolved a lot since then, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, I, I think I, I think there's always a dual role capability out there, and I think it's important. I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Strike Eagles fly in air policing in Estonia today. Uh, that's you know, they're, 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 <laughs> we we do we do not have the luxury that we had back during the Cold War. You know, we had close to twenty fighter wings in Europe. Uh, you know, there just aren't as many airplanes out there. So every airplane, there aren't enough F twenty twos to go around, um, and and. Uh, you know, certainly the weapons loadout and the endurance of a Strike Eagle, it's a very, very capable asset for something like the uh, the, the air defense mission uh, with an incredibly capable radar. So, so yeah, I, I think uh, I think it would be it would be foolish to not train such that you can always exploit that capability. I mean, that the when I was a squadron commander at Lake and Heath, I, I, I tried to. Th- there was always a lot of good natured competition with the. You know the light. We had a you know one light gray squad in the 493rd, which is just about closing down as we speak. Um, but and we were tied. We were tied to them in the AEF. And I was like, look, I don't want to hear a bunch of bad mouthing of the Reapers. That there are bros. We're going to go to war with those guys. You know, you don't have to be as good at their job as they are at their job because you have a different job. But but our but our capabilities need to be complementary. Um, and and they and they can be. You know, another. Go off on a tangent here. When I was up in Alaska as a weapons officer, we were flying a turkey shoot, and of course, you know, the the and, and when you're flying against F-16s as, a, as an eagle, you know, the, the Vipers are always going to start out in resolution cells so that you can't tell how many, and then they're going to do the exploding cantaloupe, whatever, to try to get somebody in above or below or whatever. And I I went over after we had done this turkey shoot, uh, we were still developing the terminology. And it's a standard, you know, it's a standard, I think it's a three dash one now, you know, if, if a strike Eagle says eyeball six, you know, you bet, you know, you should pay attention and listen to that. So I, I went over to one of the, the C model squadrons with a, with a, a tape from one of the airplanes of the Turkey shoot. And, and you hear the, and I, I don't, I don't think the call got out or got made, but you know, when they, when they initially locked this group in the Turkey shoot and boom, you know, the targeting pod is now slave to the air to air radar line of sight. And you can count against that nice, cold, dark Alaska sky, six little hot dots, and then a seventh one low, which was a Learjet jamming platform. And at 20 miles, you could even see four of them, you know, doing a doing a, a spiral down to low altitude and, you know, two of them going to the notch. And, and the, you know, the sea model guys are just like, Holy shit, that's some really good SA. Like, yeah. <laughs> so when you hear us say this, you know, you know, pay attention. Uh, so, so, you know, we, we, we were, I was very fortunate throughout my career. All of my Strike Eagle assignments were at bases that also had light graves. Uh, and I, and I was always, you know, as a commander in particular, I was adamant about, you know, we're not in competition with those guys. We need to be developing, you know, mutually supportive capabilities and tactics. You know, we can do things that make their job easier and they can certainly do things that make our job easier. Uh, and that, you know, it was, it was kind of getting beyond that, you know, eighth graders on a playground, you know, who's better attitude and, and, and getting to the, the more mature, how do, how do we employ our capabilities together uh, to maximize the, the bang for the buck? So. 
even though every every striking guy worries sick that some C model guy will get his mid kill. But <laughs> so, so speaking speaking of lantern, then we, we we've referenced it a couple of times. But can you talk a little bit about? what it is then and and, and whether it, well i suppose it's still you know the aq13 the, the nav pod i guess is still relevant kind of but you know what 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 did it mean at the time and and um, and what does it mean today lantern well i mean it, it you know it allows you to go low at night i mean prior to that i mean you you're unless you've got some kind of well actually i say that nowadays with uh, with night vision goggles, you can, you know, you can employ significantly low altitude even without a train falling system. But the combination of those two things, you know, really, really maximizes your, your capability. Um, you can, I, you know, I, to this day, I don't know, or I cannot recall if we were ever cleared to do TFR in IMC. I don't, I don't think we ever really were. There was absolutely, you, you, and you will recall this from writing your book, that the F-111 was an in-the-weather interdiction airplane. The Strike Eagle was kind of sold as an under-the-weather, and which never made any sense to me because, yeah, if you're in the weather, the FLIR doesn't work, which is kind of inconvenient and makes, make, you know, increases the pucker factor, but the terrain-following radar still works, same way it did in the F-111. You know, so there was absolutely no reason that you couldn't fly, T, you know, TFR or auto TFR uh, in the soup. I mean, the capability was always there, still is there today, um, if, if that's what you what you chose to do. So I, that, that had to have been some kind of an Air Force decision to separate mission space or whatever that they called it and, and under the weather fighter instead of an in the weather fighter, because it was perfectly capable. I mean, I believe me, there are a lot of nights in Alaska you know, where the, the, the front of the, the IR pod, you know, has got a nice flat, you know, plate on it uh, on, on the front of the pod. Well, that, that accumulates some icing when you're cruising along at the icing level. So I can remember some sorties in Alaska where you you finally, you know, you're looking through the nav, through the FLIR, and everything's just kind of a fuzzy mess. And you get down to low altitude and, you know, suddenly about, you know, you push it up to 500 knots and suddenly after about two or three minutes, boom, the world appears because the aerodynamic heating has melted the ice off the front of the, the front of the FLIR. So were we legal doing that? I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you could, you could kind of see out in front of you and you had a radar system to keep you from hitting the ground. And if you were using that properly, you were, you were plenty safe, but. And, and the targeting pod element then, uh, did that, I, I mean, people, people sort of talk about things like revolution and, and sort of quantum leaps in capability, but it feels a bit like the target pod really brought the strike eagle into its own then. So you, you had these yeah. amazing technologies in the airplane embedded within the airplane, but, but it was something mm -hmm. actually you hung on the outside of it that really transformed it. Yeah, no, that, that absolutely true. Now, now, I I never flew paved tac. Uh, the, the, we we did have some guys in the in the cadre that had paved spike experience in the F four or paved tac ex experience in, in the in the F one eleven. So we had a pretty good we had a pretty good baseline of guys who had who you know uh, done targeting. By we had one guy, Steve Farrow, who came out of the the four thirty first at McClellan, uh, doing OT and E for the for the. Uh, um, uh, for the F-111, and he was a real expert in pave tech and, and GBU-15, a lot of other weapons. So, the, you know, th those guys were really, really key in getting us up to speed quickly with the targeting pod. I mean, I, you know, I, I can tell you, by the time I started flying with the targeting pod, I was pretty comfortable in the airplane. Uh, you know, I felt like I was, you know, on top of it. And that first night sortie with the targeting pod is like, holy cow, now all of a sudden you've got this, a new SA magnet, you know, uh, in, in in front of you that you're staring at all the time, and you had to eventually learn don't stare at that damn thing all the time. Um, but uh, uh, it, it seemed like every time you added something new to the airplane, you're like, oh my god, guys are going to be overwhelmed. Um, and and, and it, it, it it always is a little bit overwhelming at first when you add a new sensor to the airplane uh, and, and something else that you have to pay attention to. But but but. Uh, I, I think initially you wind up spending too much attention to the new thing. And then over time, you just kind of, you know, it just gets built into your cross check and it becomes second nature. Um, and, and that, you know, as I've said, we're, we're I, I never flew the airplane with data link. I, I flew in the, the I guess the one sortie I had in 2008, we, we had data link. It wasn't 
when exactly working and it was only a two ship. So it wasn't, you know, exploiting the full capabilities, but all the conversation I've had with people that have, you know, flown with data link on a war with data link, you know, that, that was yet another revolution in the, in the capability of the airplane. Um, but yeah, it, it, you know, certainly had the strike Eagle not gotten targeting pods for desert storm, uh, they, they would not have, acquitted themselves nearly as well. And of course, early on in Desert Storm, there were very few pods available. So they were flying two ships uh, where the lead airplane had a targeting pod and the wingman was just muling bombs. You know, so so they were they would carry, you know, eight, eight GBU 12s on each airplane and the lead would drop his his eight bombs and then he'd start designating for the for the wingman's eight bombs. Um, and uh, and they, as as you as you're well aware, they did a lot, much like the F-111s, did a lot of uh, a lot of tank plinking in the in the latter latter part of uh, of Desert Storm. So yeah, the the you know having the having the uh, targeting pod was absolutely key to really making it a, a you know a, a PGM platform. Uh, and that, of course, for for many many years, that was the bread and butter of the of the uh, Strike Eagle was GBU tens and GBU twelves. So. So as the, as the context for all of this, then, I mean, you, you mentioned that, uh, of course, within a year or two of you standing the squadron up and, and being in the initial cadre, your students were going to war. But, but as the context for the work you were doing, were you thinking about particular scenarios? Were you thinking about permissive or non-permissive environments? Um, w- when, you, when you bring an aeroplane into service like this, do you actually have to extricate yourself a little bit from some of the constraints that real life may bring in order to do it? I, I think for the most part, I, I would like to say yes, but I, I don't think that'd be an honest answer. I, I think most of us assumed, you know, a relatively high threat scenario that forced you to go at low altitude, you know, be that Korea or, uh, uh, or Europe or, uh, or wherever. I mean, we weren't thinking a lot about the Middle East at, at that time. Um, that, that was just kind of the, the assumption is that you were going to be in, a, in a, an environment that forced you down to, to low altitude, except for air to air. For whatever, whatever reason, I guess we accepted the fact that air to air would, would be flown at, uh, uh, you know, at least D- DCA would potentially be flown over, over uh, friendly airspace at, at medium altitude. But most of our surface attack stuff was or pretty much exclusively our surface attack stuff was was flying at low altitude. Now it's you know you can ask the question every, every time I see pictures on Facebook of you know airplanes flying through the mock loop, um, you know I have to ask myself you know when is the day going to come when they say why are those guys still doing that you know why are F thirty fives doing it? Well, I can tell you why they're doing it because it's really really fun. <laughs> and, and you're not you know. <laughs> If you're going to get convince guys to keep flying fighters, you got to you guys and gals to fly fighters. You got to allow them to have a little bit of fun. Um, but yeah, we we were flying. Uh, I, I remember sitting through a really good briefing. It was when I was a squadron commander at at headquarters USAFE, and uh, a guy named Pigpen, who was the commander of the the five tenth at uh, at Aviano, and this was right after Allied Force was was giving a briefing about. How do we just go to war at medium altitude with night vision goggles dropping LGBs? And what's the RTU syllabus at Luke for the Viper? It's, you know, flying low altitude and doing pop to 10 degree with a BDU 33. You know, there's a disconnect here. <laughs> and there certainly was a, a disconnect there that we were, um, as much as we very quickly transitioned to a new way of employing the airplane in Desert Storm, it took years for the RTU syllabuses to catch up to that and realize that, you know, what we're really going to do here is much more likely to be medium altitude employment with PGMs and doing pop to, you know, 10 degree and 20 degree uh, low drag deliveries doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, there, there's a there's a certain value to it. I think it's worth exposing the student to, but, you know, should that be our bread and butter? Probably not. Who, who drives the decision then to do it that way? Presumably there's an element of, a building block approach where I don't know the simplest things are done at the RTU, and then when you get on the squadron, then you can learn the complex tactics yeah. of medium altitude altitude employment. I don't know, but is that yeah. what's behind it? Is it money? Is it they want to just push people through the pipeline quickly? Yeah, it's it's a lot. Of, a lot of it's inertia. I mean, it, that's that's part of it is deciding what should be taught in the RTU and what should be taught when you get to your operational squadron. There's there's always always a little bit of you know debate over over that. Um, and, uh, 
I, I think, uh, uh, of course, the, the uh, during the time that I was uh, an RTU instructor at Luke, we were under TAC, uh, Tactical Air Command. They later became part of uh, AETC under the training command. And so, so that was, uh, you know, the, it, when you're under the training command, there's a whole major command infrastructure for syllabus development and the syllabus review conferences and all this kind of stuff. You know, the weapons school plays into that, you know, driving what the, you know, what uh, ought to be, ought to be taught, what the standards ought to be for the community, 3-1, all, all of those things. Um, I, I'm not an expert in how all those, those pieces fit together, but but it's, you know, once you become a mature weapon system, it becomes a slow inertial process in getting change. You know, we were, one of the things, you know, going back to the, the joke about it's only software, with a glass cockpit airplane, we just thought, well, shoot, that's just software. Just, we just get them to change that. You know, this is, and this is how you wind up with 5 million lines of code in the F-35. But back in those early days, I mean, literally, I we we made we made changes for software software uh, change proposals for the airplane, and six months later we were flying with that. I mean, early on, you know, now you know uh, the re software releases are on a very regimented schedule and you know tied to testing and all that. We were getting a new software take about every six months during those early early days. So it was really cool to be able to make a suggestion like let's put a compass rose around the RWR uh, and actually see it you know, come to fruition. My claim to fame is that when you make an HRM patch map, you know, you're, you're, you're always trying, depending on what angle you map it from, you, you always wanted to have a target area photo. Radar predictions went the way of the Buffalo. If you had a photo of the target, you could see what it was going to look like in a high resolution map. But you always kind of wanted to know which, which end is up and, and whatnot. And I, I'll never forget the day I called uh, the, the radar engineer at Mac Air and I said, does the radar know where north is? And he goes, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's got a whole coordinate system. I'm like, could you put that on the display for us? He's like, sure. <laughs> so I'm, I'm the father of the North Arrow, which is now on like every display in the airplane. I, I didn't suggest putting it in the targeting pod and everything else that kind of went hog wild. But the but the, the North Arrow and an HRM patch map, that was my idea. I wrote the software change proposal and, and it didn't it didn't happen during my first assignment when, when I came back to the uh, came back to the airplane um, in uh, uh, later years that that had been implemented. Things had slowed down a little bit, but I said somewhere in a drawer here, I still have copies of some of the original software change proposals that I wrote for the airplane. Yeah. So, presumably, so, presumably it, the, the, the downside to that, though, is so if you've got such a frequent release cycle, you are in a sense being beta testers, are you? Are you also then finding bugs? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah they, w without, a, without a doubt. I mean, there were, you know, when, when we first got the airplane, there were a bunch of, you know, wacky things that you had to do during ground operations to, you know, get the, it was called the MPDP, multi purpose display processor, basically drove all the displays in the airplane. And, uh, uh, and that, you know, you had to cycle the power on that twice and, you know, sprinkle chicken blood over your left shoulder or whatever to get the, get the airplane to wake up. So, yeah, there's was, was a lot of those things. And most of those were, were resolved uh, pretty, pretty early on. I, I will tell you a funny story that when the MPDP failed, or excuse me, when the central computer failed, um, the, the, all the displays in the aircraft went to one fixed configuration, which was you know, a rude awakening, you know, if you if you were used to having a full up airplane, but it was like light years more avionics than you had in an F-4 and, you know, better in most respects than an F-111. And I, I took off one day at Lake and Heath. It was a weapons school spin up ride. I was flying with Steve Quast, who later went on to be the, the commander of AETC. Killer was, was my, it was just before I became the commander. And Killer was my, was the uh, ops officer. And, uh, and we, we were flying a weapons school spin up ride we're number two and we're going to be defensive looking over our shoulder all day. And we get, you know, as soon as the weight came off the wheels the central computer failed, which if it was going to fail, that seemed to be when it happened. So boom, you know, all the displays go to this thing and we're like, oh, that's bad. And we go into the soup and, you know, we pop out on top and we went through the procedures and cycled it a couple of times. Couldn't get it to come back. So we just called him in the ox and said, you know, hey, be advised, uh, two's got a central computer failure. And the next thing we know, he's calling approach control going, oh, we need to go to Liberty and dump gas and all this stuff. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't say we didn't want to fly. <laughs> it's like we're going to 
go DBFM for crying out loud. We don't need all this magic. We're going to be looking over our shoulder. I mean, it was just, it was, it was such a classic, you know, example of, of, you know, the, the, the uh, flight lead that was getting ready to go to weapon school was, uh, um, you know, he was a strike Eagle baby. He had been a strike Eagle Wizzo and had just, just come back to, uh, uh, to, to fly in the front seat and, um, and, and to just, you know, in his mind, man, if your central computer's not working, you're going to go home. Like, no. <laughs> you know, we we got all we need here trust us you know so <laughs> you said right at the beginning there was you know 16 model guys there were some a10 guys there were some f16 guys there were some f4 guys and and the pilot wizzo uh, ratio was was one to one but were, were there challenges then around being a wizzo and running the radar i mean that's another thing you mentioned you know, mm-hmm. back in the day you were when this was happening you were running the radar nowadays it's more likely to be the guy in the front or the girl in the front who's running the mm-hmm. radar um, but were there challenges in getting an f-16 guy or, or an f-15 guy to let uh, a wizzo run the radar i mean were there um, are there cultural differences there yeah it, it, it varied a little bit there, there were certainly there, there were some f-15 guys that were used to flying the you know flying low running the radar and they and they wanted to they wanted to keep doing that um uh they, they were they weren't they, they weren't they were the minority i will say I think the the A10 guys probably struggled the most with crew coordination for, for just whatever reason. I mean, I think that took them longer to get used to the idea of, of flying with a Wizzo. Um, as I said, our, our two F16 guys both had time in the F4 previously, so it wasn't you know it wasn't terribly terribly new to them. Um, certainly, as, as the airplane has has evolved, I mean, there are certain things you can do in the airplane where you can do it all by yourself. You know, if you're just going to out flying and flying an intercept and shoot an AMRAM. You, you can do all that from the front seat. I would I would argue you can do it better if you exploit the back seat. Or you're less likely to lose visual and there or have someone roll in behind you. Um, so so those you know figuring you know deconflicting things like who's primarily doing sensors and who's primarily doing visual lookout. Um, you know that that I, I never I never got to fly close air support in combat, but you know when you're you know the the uh, that's a, that's very backseat intensive, you know, finding and identifying targets on the ground, a lot of heads down time in the pod, copying nine lines for, from a JFAC or whatever, you know, the Wizzo's pretty damn busy doing all that stuff. Uh, so in that situation, the pilot's flying the airplane and doing visual lookout and, and, and you know, trying to see, is there anything I can see with my eyeballs that'll contribute to, to what he's seeing in the pod? So there's a lot of, um, what, you know, what we what we hit on very early on is that, Roles and responsibilities were not fixed. They they shifted on phase of flight. You know, e- even the phase of an intercept. You know, we we always uh, you know typically when we were training intercepts, the the Wizzo ran the radar uh, until you were sorted and targeted. And once you know prior to taking that first aim seven shot, you were going to uh, dating myself because yes, we were shooting aim sevens back in the back in the in those days. Um, you were going to pass the radar to the front seat because once you timed out that missile, now you're in the visual maneuvering environment and you want the front seater to have command of the radar. Uh, and, and the assumption was as long as you're visual maneuvering, the front seater is running the radar, the back seater is primarily visual lookout. You know, at, at some point when you're egressing that fight, the WIZO would take the radar back to, to get set up for, you know, another another long range picture. So you you had to you had to be flexible enough to you know, hand off those responsibilities and change what what your crew duties were, you know, even from the beginning to an end of an intercept, you know, let alone the beginning and end of a flight. So. Did you did you see a change in that then uh, over the years that you you were flying the Strike Eagle and to the point where you you, know, you flew it for the last time? W- w- did those sorts of things remain the same, or you know, did the did the dynamic shift, or were there new things that were coming into play? Yeah, they they're, they're, they definitely were shifting as as the as the targeting pod became more and more capable uh, in air to air. You know it, that you know trying to trying to run both of them at the same time. Uh, was was uh, particularly demanding, and, and and what I again, this is you know hearsay, but what I'm told is with the advent of data link, you know the the, the Wizzo is doing so much stuff managing 
data link and, and linking, you know, other other sensors or whatever, you can cue your targeting pod to a target track from your wingman's radar or something like that, um, that, that, you know, primary responsibility for the radar has, has shifted, uh, shifted back to the front seat. But that was certainly in the early days, the bloodiest academic lesson I ever taught was our very first class, which, as I said, was chock full of all the generals execs that that uh, that weren't in the in the initial cadre, and uh, and one one of whom was a guy, he's the only guy I've ever known, and went to both weapons school and test pilot school, and his attitude was, and he had flown the the you know two nine one back when it was you know first being the idea was first being developed, and his attitude was, if I told them five years ago to do it like this, then that's the way it is. <laughs> period you know because why would they not listen to me uh and so yeah getting him to getting him to listen to anything other than his preconceived notion was it was a challenge but i remember standing up trying to to teach the the initial crew coordination block and admittedly it was rough i mean we were it was early on but i mean he was you know he basically just took over my academic you know you know, walk, walked up on the stage took the chalk away from me he's like oh i'm gonna tell you how this airplane is really supposed to work <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, there was some bloody battle, but, but I remember one of the slides, one of the slides in that academic block had primary duties for the pilot and the WISO. And for, you know, remember the WISO's aeronautical rating is navigator. The primary duties for the pilot for low altitude were fly the airplane, navigate. <laughs> navigation was that was primarily the responsibility of the pilot it was not the wizzo's responsibility now the wizzo still did most of the mission planning and you had a moving map display and as he used to say in jest like dude if you can't follow that little pink line i got nothing for you you know okay i did i did all the planning here's where you need to go i'm busy doing other stuff here so and and that and that was true i mean you know navigation was primarily the pilot responsibility and that because there was there's no reason you had such accurate navigation systems you know, moving map display, I mean, all these other aids, why, you know, why would you make that a wizard responsibility when there's so many other sensor duties that, that that person could be doing? So that, I mean, that was certainly a change from, from uh, earlier, earlier aircraft. Kind of interesting, you know, your sort of cautionary tale around saying to people don't get sort of, you know, infatuated with this particular thing, or don't become over reliant on that particular technology. Do you, do you think that there's a limit to how basic um you can train somebody to operate at you know how basic a level you could train someone to operate at so so is it realistic to say well you know ultimately you as a crew should have the ability to dial in a couple of mils of of you know <laughs> deflection on on a on a fixed gun site and and deliver a mark 82 from 6000 feet in a 45 degree dive at I don't know, 540 knots. I mean, where, where where do you draw the line? You know, where do you say this level of proficiency is the the minimum that we expect? Yeah, that, that's, um, you know, I, I remember in my F-111 days, the the, the INS, you know, could be pretty fickle. Uh, it, it dumped fairly frequently. The, you know, there are lots of guys. Uh, I, I was crewed with a guy for a while, you know, that, you know, he'd, he'd been bit one too many times using a, a computed delivery where, you know, the computer hiccup, hiccuped and, you know, threw a bomb unscorable at, at, at six or something. And he's like, that's it. I'm done. You know, I'm, and he just he always did manual bombing, you know, even in a digital avionics F-111, he always did manual bombing uh, because he just because he knew what he was going to get. And it was entirely up to him. But, you know, be, because he did it all the time, he was proficient at it. Um, it was pretty hard to. um you know, we, we had a squadron commander at the time who was always telling about how you needed to be able to crank mills and do these backup deliveries. You know, I you you, you I think you can enter a manual mill site depression in the Strike Eagle still, but you know, one it would probably take the crew three minutes to find where where it was to enter it. <laughs> <laughs> would be astonished if they could actually, you know, deliver, uh, you know, because, you know, hitting, hitting precise parameters for manual delivery, that's, that's an art form. Uh, yeah, it's, so, so, you know, back, back in those days, flying an airplane that was somewhat notoriously unreliable, the F-111D, there was a good reason to practice those backups all the time. You know, once you get to a certain level of reliability, now you're making the trade-off of how much time do we spend employing with backup modes 
that, you know, there's a 1% chance we're going to use them versus enhancing our capability to fully exploit, you know, a, a fully operational airplane. So, yeah, it's kind of a... Uh, uh, you 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 all you know you always talk about getting you know every every flight you brief you brief contingencies you know what do we do if one airplane aborts what do we do if you know we got a radar failure you know you you always brief certain basic contingencies uh, but yeah you know, really really training for those kind of backups yeah most I'm I'm guessing most squadrons don't prioritize that very high just because the 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 bang for the buck in doing it is is. Uh, is just not there. But I mean, obviously, if you get, you know, if you get told data link's not going to work for the next year because, you know, the, the frequencies aren't, aren't authorized, then you're going to, you're going to shift gears in a hurry and start figuring out how to, you know, how to do things in, a, in an alternate, alternate way of operating. Now, I hadn't heard that. I, I, I'd be curious to, we would be curious to hear from somebody currently flying the airplane. That had to have been a, uh, a, a real wake up call because, I think people have become very, very reliant on that. Yeah, I mean the. Been a big deal. Yeah, I mean because the the, the C model guys used to refer to the drool cup. You know, it's a, it's a pretty small display. The original Eagle display is only a four inch display there in the cockpit, and you know, so somebody leaning forward, you know, trying to get sorted and targeted or whatever, you know, leaning over the drool cup, and uh, and they said, you know, the, the classic radio call from the new wingman is too sorted, blind. Because <laughs> it's just it's pretty hard to it's pretty hard to maintain visual with your leader and do all this you know heads down stuff in the in the in the cockpit um, and uh, and I I remember guys telling me that that the term sit visual had had come into being in the in the Strike Eagle two is sit visual in other words yeah I I, I can see you on my data link display my situation display <laughs> so well that's not the same as visual uh, but, but obviously you know if you can tell that I'm roughly two miles line abreast with my leader you know maybe he's a little high a little low I've lost him in the cloud layer okay I mean in other words you could lose visual and get it back a lot quicker uh, and I'm sure now with the with the helmet you know it, it's telling you where your where your leader is but uh um, yeah, so so yeah, a lot, a lot of those things they become second nature, and then if they go away, you're going to have to you're going to have to start building a, a backup habit pattern for it. But but I, I I doubt there are many flight leads going out saying, okay, we're going to turn off these systems today and see how. We do. I mean, that's that, that is the kind of thing you know you do every so often, you know, for fun when you're bombing for quarters or whatever, and just see who you know who can. Uh, you know, figure out backup systems the best, but I, I I don't think it's a primary training focus. Speaking of sophistication, you you mentioned uh, the GBU fifteen earlier in the context of mm -hmm. um, you know sort of the the uh, the struggle coming into service. Did you have visibility at the time of things like AGM one thirty? So I, I suppose what's sort of noteworthy about the Strike Eagle at this point in its history is that it's still sort of a, you know, pretty much, it's going to it's going to kill things that are close to it, really, on the ground at least. You know, mm. you you've got sort of LGB capability of maybe a couple of miles or whatever. Um, I know that Maverick was initially trained to. I don't know if you did any of that, but that I, I actually of, get to I, I got to shoot a Maverick in uh, weapon school, which was kind of fun. It's the only it's the only boosted munition that you can launch from the back seat. So oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't fire air to air missiles in the back seat, but you can. I, I think the same was true for AGM one thirty for air to ground munitions. You could launch in the back seat, so I, I got to fire the Maverick on my on my weapon school sortie. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I thought the Maverick was a uh, and actually um, a guy named Hal Hovey and I deployed just prior to Desert Storm. They were doing a quick look OT and E on various infrared IFF devices. And they needed a crew that could go down to Yuma. Um, and I'd never flown Maverick in my life. <laughs> they, they loaded, I mean, I think I'd done it like, you know, one time in the sim at Mac Air, and they loaded up a training Maverick that they'd stolen from the F-16 wing. And we took the airplane down to, to Yuma for the weekend and flew in this OT. And it was literally like two weeks before Desert Storm. They're like, okay, we're going to pick the winning device and we're going to manufacture 10,000 of them in the next two weeks. And deploy them to every every tank in the in the theater and like okay good luck with that but um uh but yeah that so that that was uh um 
uh, aside, and that was before I went to weapons school, so that uh, was kind of my first exposure to Maverick. We we talked a little bit about Maverick in, in Alaska. We never really, uh, I, I was kind of advocating making that one of our primary munitions in Alaska, and it never, uh, and squadron commander wasn't was not sold on that at all. We did do GBU fifteen uh, in all, uh, yeah, in Alaska and in in, uh, uh, in England. GB fifteen was a pain in the neck munition to train with because you, you had to, you know, you had to have jets configured specifically with the training munitions, and that kind of locked in those lines on the schedule, and it created all kinds of because of the weight and balance, you know, the extra weight of the munitions you know you always had a you know takeoff and landing dad was always a concern with with uh, slippery runways and stuff like that so it was a you know the, it, it had some drawbacks but certainly it, it it you know brought some uh uh some significant added capability now we we, and we did have guys in in the early days that had gbu 15 uh, uh experience um, and the guy that I mentioned earlier came out of McClellan. He actually, I, I think, had flown some of the AGM-130 tests on the 111 before he came to came to Loops. So, so yeah, we, we were we were looking down the road to those, you know, those kind of munitions. Now, things like things like GPS guided munitions and small diameter bomb, I and mean, that was all way too out, in the, way too far out in the future at that time for us to uh, to be thinking about. But, but it, it, at the same time, it was pretty evident that any new whiz bang toy. That we get is probably going to get put on a strike eagle, and there was just you know, given the the range and payload of the airplane, you know, you figure any anything new, we're gonna we're gonna get it eventually, and I think that's been proven true. They, they use so when they did the DRF competition, they they had the outboard pylons installed, um, stuck, stuck harms on them. I don't know if they were ever wired. Do you know anything about that? To, to... I, I don't. We, we I, I don't. I've never never seen an airplane with pylons uh, on on the outside pylons, and I I, I don't. I don't know if anything was ever wired up there. That does remind me of a funny story that the Mac Air, the, the SR-71 had a capability where when the Q model plugged the, the airplane, the boomer was hot mic. You didn't have to, you didn't have to talk on UHF radio, you had hot mic. The first couple of airplanes that were delivered to Luke were configured that way because Mac Air thought the Air Force wanted it. And I, I don't know what they were going to charge the Air Force for it, but then the Air Force said, "No, we didn't ask for that." And uh, so, okay, so they stopped putting it in. But we, there were a couple of tail numbers on the ramp that had that capability. So you had to be careful what you said <laughs> when you were when you were plugged in. <laughs> There's a story which I will not relate in detail, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, they came back in the debrief like, you know, man. Was a quick disconnect. It's almost like she could hear us. And someone said, "She could hear you, dumbass." <laughs> but that was, and, and we were told that was like a, you know, it was like a five dollar part that would have given us that capability. And I, you know, it would make a lot of sense to put that in every airplane we build in the future. But <laughs> and what did you come out of the experience having learned? Well, uh, the, the uh, from, from the early days, it's it's you know be flexible and be open minded. You know, you you can't you can't come into a new airplane with a doctrinaire attitude that you know this is the way it needs to be done. You 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 need to you you need to you know set aside the preconceived notions and, and start with a relatively blank set sheet of paper. And say what? What's the you know? What do we think is the best? You know, given all of our experience and knowledge, what do we think is the is the best way to, to do business here? Uh, and I think that's what we tried to do. Um, you know, we, we were handed a syllabus, but but we were you know in terms of the you know what we were teaching was was fairly well defined in terms of you know you're going to fly this many BFM rides, this many service stack rides, but but the details of what we're going to teach and how to you know how to get a bomb off the airplane, how best to run the radar during an intercept. All of those things were, you know, that was all, uh, you know, just being developed as 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 we went along. Uh, and and I think you know, I think guys were were pretty good about being being open open minded and trying new things, and that that helped. But, you know, some not every not everybody was equally open minded, but I but I think it, in the end that was the that was kind of the the default was uh, was that you know people were were willing to, you know, willing to try something new and, and, and see how it worked. Um, you know, a, a new airplane is, is uh, uh, and, and we had the luxury of, you know, we, we kind of understood how F-15s flew. Um, 
you know, as I said, we were initially limited in G limits. We're also limited, I think, to 150 knots min airspeed for, for a short while. And I, and I was I was in the sortie where the first time we broke that rule, we were in a nose high fight with a with a viper. And I and I glanced up at the HUD and saw the airspeed rolling back through 40 knots. <laughs> and I said, airspeed, and I pitched voice. And the front seater said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And, the, and the, I remember the, in the debrief, the student in the in the F-16 said, Man, it looked like you guys were dropped by a crane because <laughs> the, the the eagle, when it's nose high, will eventually run out of airspeed and start to tail slide, and then it'll just pitch over, and and the nose will will flop down to you know if you if you depart at eighty degrees nose high, it'll fall to about eighty degrees nose low. But but you are literally just falling through space, and the the student the stu- in fact the IP said you know I got the airplane because I've seen this before. <laughs> we're going to get out of the way. So and and we discovered that guess what the airplane departed pretty much the same way a, a, a C model does. But uh, so we had the luxury of not having to worry about a lot of things with emergency procedures. We could focus on avionics and tactics in, in that in that new airplane. Um, and, and so that was, you know, that that was, you know, it's fun and exciting to have a have a new toy. I, I remember a few years ago, they there's a picture in Air Force Times or something of the 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 F-35 initial cadre guys at Luke. And it was it was funny because it was so reminiscent of exactly the same picture back in 1988 of the, the first, you know, the Strike Eagle guys that was, the, the, you know, uh, the five guys that happened to be there at Luke that got them, get, got them together and took that picture. And I thought, God, it'd be, it'd be interesting to talk to those guys and pass on some of, some of what we learned from, uh, from our early days. Because we just, we don't bring new airplanes into the inventory very often. It's kind of a, almost a once in a generation opportunity to, to bring out a new airplane. Do you think it's a, it's a, I suppose it's a question of culture, but maybe it's more about human nature than culture, but do you think that there's an appetite to, to learn from those lessons of the past? I, I speak to so many guests who say they, you know, they learned something 20 years ago and then, you know, recently they see the mistakes repeated again, or or there's an opportunity to transfer knowledge and it's never and it's not taken. Or you've got simple things like, you know, the the, the story of a weapons officer who doesn't want to address new tactics because you know he thinks the old ones are fine, even though perhaps they're not. But but do you, so so is this is it is it cultural or is it, is it is it human nature to want to just find these things out for yourself um okay you bring a new airplane into service actually let we'll 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 make our own mistakes we'll fall over and trip up and scuff our own knees we don't need someone else to tell us how how painful it is and therefore this is what you should do yeah there's there's a little bit of that there's you know getting getting past the you know certainly you know if 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 you had told us in 1988 hey we're gonna we're gonna bring in a bunch of you know old f100 drivers on a on a friday afternoon and have them talk to you i i, I think we'd have done it i mean we'd be happy to drink beer with a bunch of old fighter pilots but but i i think we'd have been skeptical about okay what are they gonna you know what are they gonna tell us because it, it is a new set of challenges you know for every every generation of, of aircraft um but but i think the, the the process of how you do it i mean how you how you, you know, the, what we did with the Strike Eagle of selecting that diverse group of people. Um, and the, I know the F-22 did this to some extent, because I knew some Strike Eagle guys that, that, that went to the F-22, that they, they, you know, the F-22 was obviously kind of seen as a replacement for the, for the light gray Eagle, but, but there were people that knew the F-22 is going to drop bombs and they, and they knew they needed to, to bring in some guys. So I, I knew, you know, probably half a dozen guys with Strike Eagle backgrounds that went to the F-22 fairly early on. And I, and I, I credit them with, with the decision to do that, to say we need a, you know, we don't want to take everybody out of one community. You know, if, if, you, had, if you had built the Strike Eagle initial cadre all out of one community, I don't care what it was, I, you know, all F-4 guys, all F-15 guys, whatever, you wouldn't have gotten nearly the same results, I don't think, uh, as we did with that you know, really diverse group of people coming from, from, uh, you know, varied backgrounds. You start with, you know, br- bringing in people with a, with a variety of different experience and, 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 and hopefully people, and it's not like, it's not like we were screened for this, but hopefully you bring in people that are willing to, you know, willing to listen to other people's ideas about how to, how to do business. And, you know, there were some people that are very good at that. There were some people that were famously bad at that. <laughs> 
Well, that that was going to be sort of my part B of the of the same the same sort of questionary really, around some of those tricky students that you had. Whether do you, do you think that I mean it's a silly conversation, silly question to ask, really. But I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are on it. But you know, if you had the same experience today, do you think you would have still those tricky students coming in? You know, the guy that um, you know had more sort of was a target arm and a golden arm and you know or the, the guy went on to be the squadron <laughs> commander at, at lake at, at uh, seymour do you, do you think those sorts of things would happen again still today or, or were they a product of the 1970s 1980s air force fighter pilot culture that's a that's a good question um i i guess that i i guess i don't know is the is the honest answer i i think you know hum, human beings being what they are, I, I think you're you're always going to have some people that are just that 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 aren't good listeners or or just don't make good students or or are more uh, you know more inclined to or contrarian don't want to don't want to be taught something. I mean, we had uh, and we we had you know, even later on in later classes, just regular TX conversion classes. You know, there were just some real hard hard headed guys like here's the way I've been doing it and trying to tell them. Um, so, so some guys, some guys going through the conversion, you know, transitioning, you know, mostly F4 guys from Seymour. It was the, the bulk, you know, the later classes tended to be probably 70% Seymour guys that were converting in place from the F4 to the Strike Eagle. And then the rest of the class were, you know, people from various, various backgrounds coming off staff assignments. Um, but yeah, you had some guys, they were just like, you know, hey, I'm a fighter pilot. I'm, you know, I know how to do this. And, you know, you can't tell me anything. And, you know, some of those guys had a pretty rough road um, that, that just just didn't like being a student. Uh, you know, you're going to be a student multiple times in your Air Force career. In fact, the greatest job in the world is being, I never got to do a senior officer checkout as an 06, but the greatest job in the world is uh, being a TX course student. Re- retraining in an airplane you've already flown. I, I came home when I was getting recalled at Seymour uh, before I left the Pentagon. I uh, I came home one weekend and, and I was telling war stories over breakfast on Sunday with my wife, flying with a bunch of guys that I, you know, had, had known for years. And, and she stopped me at one point. She goes, are you learning anything new? And I said, no, honey, that's the beauty of it. I already know how to fly this airplane. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm a little rusty. Uh, and I'm going out and, you know, guys are writing grade sheets on me that I wrote grade sheets on years ago. But yeah, I already know how to do this. I'm just, you know, getting the knocking the rust off. And and meanwhile, I'm getting credit for time in the Pentagon. That is winning right there. So yeah, so you know that that's if 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 you can't if you can't set your ego aside and 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 be a student, you know, you're just you're gonna you're gonna struggle at various points in your career. You know, so that's a you know that that's just one of those things that you got to learn as a human being. I think to you know to be successful. There does appear to be a phenomenon, and maybe it's sort of you're a bit of an outlier or an anomaly if it happens to you. But there is a phenomenon where experienced guys go back to an MDS and they then fail the the TX course. They, you know, for whatever reason, they can't get back into the groove. They can't fly the airplane anymore if they're a pilot or if they're a, a, a nav or wizzo. Um, you know, they, they don't have the mental dexterity anymore to run the systems or, or to do those those responsibilities. Do you think that? I mean, it's interesting to hear you say you sort of you you obviously enjoyed your experience going back through the the, the TX course, but but it's great. <laughs> did you, have, have you seen that before then? Where people, I mean, you know, can some of the behaviour be explained by trepidation or insecurity? Uh, you know, the possibility of, of failing it, of not getting back into the cockpit. Yeah, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think. I, I don't remember because you know when I was an RTU instructor in the striking, there, there was nobody with, with previous experience, uh, um, and and I don't, I don't really remember. I, I I don't have any recollection of somebody actually failing it. Um, uh, yeah, there, there, there certainly there's some guys that come off the staff, you know, after three or four years non flying, and they're kind of rusty and they know it and they feel bad about it and they're you know, just constantly worried about, am I looking bad? Um, so I, I've, I've seen guys kind of struggle a, a little bit, just not being as confident as they would like to be. I, I, I don't really recall any cases of somebody actually failing the course. Uh, I mean, we, we did have, uh, I, remember, I remember one or two folks that did not make it 
uh, either we had a couple of folks that show one, I think of at least one that was going to, uh, that, that was going to stay at, at Luke as an instructor that just, just, you know, struggled and, 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 you know, I, he eventually, he eventually went to an operational squadron, but he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, go through the, the instructor course. Um, yeah, I, I, in my F-111 days, uh, my, my, my one year as an RTU instructor, I remember we had a student who was a, he was flying, he, he had like a thousand hours in the FB-111 and he was coming over to, to TAC and somebody had decided, no, this guy needs to go through the full B course. And, and I just remember, uh, he, he was, he was just a real relaxed and easygoing guy. And I, and ju I just remember his attitude. He's like, Hey, you know, if they're going to pay me for six months, you know, to be a student, you know, learning how to fly this airplane with that, I've got a thousand hours in more power to him. And he, and he just, you know, he just, he relaxed and enjoyed himself. And I, and I guess I always kind of filed that away. If like, if they're paying you to be a student, just shut up and enjoy it. I mean, it's not, you know, don't, don't fight it. It, it, it just, it, it doesn't pay to, to do that. So, yeah, I, I think uh, now when, when I went through the, when I went through the TX course, uh, we were the we, we were dubbed the old crusties because we we were really the first TX course that they did at Seymour that were all experienced guys. I mean, all all six of us had thousand plus hours in the airplane, and uh, I, I remember you get the little speech from the ops group commander on day one and. and you know, the guy, the ops group commander came in who I remember and I failed him on one of his DBFM rides when he was, <laughs> when he was going through, going through RTU. And, uh, and he just gave us this speech, which was basically be kind to my instructors. You know, it's like, yes, I get it. You guys, you know, you're all the bros and Dover, but you, you will not beat up my instructors. <laughs> it's like, okay. And, and I was like, okay, I'm fine with that. I don't need to beat up anybody. I'm just here to fly have fun. So yeah, I, I think the, there's, there's just a lot of things in fighter aviation where your attitude is everything. If you have the wrong attitude, you can make life really difficult on yourself. And if you have the right attitude, uh, you'll have the time of your life. So, uh, and, and, I'm, and, I, and I don't know how to teach that attitude. I think you kind of you either have it or you don't. So. So, so final, final question for me then, Junior. So, so you, you mentioned well, I think a couple of times now that that obviously some of your students were going off to war um, fairly short shortly after leaving the course. Mm. Did that uh, sort of give you cause to to sort of reflect on the the quality of your teaching? Did you feel a certain mm. sense of responsibility for their futures or their fates? Even uh, mm. how did you sort of emotionally respond to that? Um, yeah, I, I think. Uh, well, the, the primary emotion was insane jealousy. I mean, the, those of us who brought the airplane into the inventory and developed the tactics and literally wrote the book were insanely jealous that lieutenants that we had just graduated three months earlier were going off to Desert Storm and we weren't. Uh, I mean, I, I will not mince words about <laughs> that. That was that was just so frustrating. Uh, we, we did have some guys in the squadron who went over uh initially in staff jobs and eventually flew flew some combat missions with the with the squadrons out, out of seymour uh, i was part of a group of eight guys that were what, what were called the attrition reserve you know the assumption being we're probably going to lose some airplanes and and you know when that happens we need replacement airplanes and replacement crews uh so we were you know we were identified on this top secret message all got called into the squadron commander's office and told you're on the list pack your bags be ready to go and of course, we all walked out of there grinning like Cheshire cats, and everybody, everybody in the squadron knew, <laughs> you know, that that uh, why we've been called in, and and, uh, uh, and we spent a little bit of time, you know, uh, we flew a few sorties, you know, together where we were just instructor CT doing night threat reactions and stuff like that, um, and uh, and you know, long story short, we got to see more that the night we got there, um, uh, they had lost two airplanes up to that time, and and which. Certainly, it started to feel real when we'd lost airplanes and lost guys that we knew and former students. Um, and uh, the night we arrived at Seymour, a two-ship launched. Um, Mikey Duvall, who uh, went on to 
follow me through three different jobs in the Air Force, <laughs> replaced me as the wing commander here at Kirtland. Mikey led a, led a two ship that launched out that night. Uh, and that was it. You know, they, they, the, the rest of us, we stayed there for about two, three weeks at Seymour and wrote grade sheets. And we eventually realized we were kind of signing our own death warrant because every, every time we wrote a, signed a grade sheet saying this guy is mission ready, that meant that was one less of us that they needed to uh, to to go to uh, go to Desert Storm. So, and and as it turned out, none of none of the eight of us ever got to deploy. So, yeah, we were you know we were jealous that we didn't get to to be in the in the big show. Um, but you know, with time and maturity, uh, certainly you know some of the some of the lieutenants that flew in that war uh, and did really really well that were you know our students. Yeah, you couldn't help but feel proud of like, you know, I, I trained that guy. That guy was a lump of clay when he showed up at Luke. And, you know, I trained him to be a fighter pilot that, you know, that made you feel good. And and, and I believe me, I, I gave that pitch many a time as a squadron commander to somebody that was going off to, to uh, you know, a non-operational tour, either to FDU or to, or to fly T-38s or whatever. I said, you know, one somebody taught your, your sorry ass to fly and it's your turn to pay, pay that back. Uh, and two, there's a great deal of satisfaction that comes with taking somebody from, you know, ground speed zero and turning them into a capable aviator. You know, it's a different kind of satisfaction than what you get uh, flying operationally, but it is very, very gratifying. Uh, so yeah, I, I, felt, I felt really, really good about the, the guys that I trained that went off to Desert Storm. Uh, and, and I'll, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say, and, and the, the, the other thing that I'll say is as proud as I am of what we did in those days in, in the airplane and developing initial tactics in the airplane, um, I, I mentioned earlier, just before I retired, I was the board president for the airplane that crashed during Odyssey Dawn in Libya. And while I was down at Aviano doing the mishap board, it was my old squadron, the 492nd, that was deployed down there. Um, and I, I asked the commander who would worked for me previously at Lake Heath, I said, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to sit in on a, on a briefing uh, for combat mission. And uh, so, so I did. I sat in as they're briefing up a four ship. And, and I just, it watered my eyes. I mean, this, what, what, what the, I'll say the kids, I can say that I'm 62 years old now, but what the kids are doing with the airplane today, and they all look like kids looking around that briefing table, um, and they're all wondering who's the, who's the ancient colonel sitting in the corner of the room. Um, when I looked at what they're briefing and what they're doing with the airplane, they are playing 3D chess, and we were playing checkers. I mean, what we were doing seemed so sophisticated at the time with a brand new glass cockpit airplane. And looking back at it now, it is just light years ahead of, of what we were doing. So that that is, if, if you want to talk about the real story of the Strike Eagle, it, it's the degree to which that airplane has evolved in all the years that we've been flying. I mean, the capability that's been added, the weapons that have been added. I mean, it, it's it, it's you know night and day. From the airplane that we flew in 1988, uh, incredible. And I, and I, I think I hold a record. I mean, I flew the very first software release that we ever had, and I flew Suite Five in the. Uh, and, I, and I think that Suite would have been like Suite Negative Three if if we were counting them that way back then. But we, they they didn't become suites until about the fourth or fifth software uh, iteration. Um, uh, so I so I you know I got to uh, be around the airplane you know, through tremendous changes. And, and I know it's continued to evolve even more. So, you know, the people are out there flying the airplane today. I mean, what they're, what they're doing with it is, uh, it was, was unimaginable to us in 1988, but it, it's a, it's a credit to the, you know, the, the inherent capability of the airplane and the, and the people that are flying it are just doing tremendous things. Well, I think that's a, a great tribute to, on which to end um, the conversation. So, Thank you for coming on the channel and, and uh, sharing your story. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks and take care.